Good morning to all of you and welcome to this remote ITER business meeting. Um, as you know, we, we like to have these meetings in person. In this case, COVID-19 has pushed us to have it remotely. So what you will be seeing, what we will be offering today is a combination of live presentations, live speaking, along with some pre-recorded videos that uh, present various parts of the ITER upcoming business opportunities, and um, as well as some panels and opportunities for Q&A, which we will introduce to you as they come. My name is Laban Koblenz, and I am the head of communication at ITER, so I will serve as your master of ceremonies. Our very first speaker is Dr. Bernard Bigot, the director general of the ITER organization. Dr. Bigot has been closely associated with ITER actually since 2003, at the time when uh, France was uh, first putting in its bid to host the project. Before his formal ITER appointment, he served two terms as the chairman and CEO of the French Alternative Energies and Nuclear Energies uh, Atomic Energy Commission, the CEA, and he earlier served two terms as France's High Commissioner for Atomic Energy. He took over in March 2015 as the ITER Director General and the physical progress that we have seen since that time, since his reform of the organization and, and leading it forward is a, is a real testimony to his leadership. He was appointed for a second term by the ITER Council, which he started uh, just in March 2020, just at the start of the, uh, of the COVID crisis in, uh, in Europe. So please uh, welcome Dr. Bernard Bigot. Indeed. Thank you very much, Leban. It's very kind of you to introduce myself. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, dear friends, dear industrial partners, present, and hopefully future for most of you. It is an honor and a great pleasure to welcome you today to the remote ITER business meeting. Since 2007, the main actor of the ITER project and their industrial partners, active, or potential, have gathered on a regular basis on the occasion of successive ITER business forums, organized every other year in a different city. The IBF, as we name it, have provided a unique opportunity to get acquainted, to share our need and expectation, and to work together for the benefit of ITER and of the industry you represent. The last IBF was held in Antibes, in the French Rivera, on 28-27, March 2019. Like all previous editions, it was a remarkable success, with more than 1,000 participants from close to 500 companies and research institutes hailing from 25 countries. In normal times, we should have met for yet another IBF in a few weeks in Marseille. But the times are not normal now, and the constraint of the COVID-19 pandemic imposed on us all has caused the cancellation of the 2021 in-person IBF edition, which is now scheduled in 2022. In the meantime, and despite the pandemic, ITER continued to move forward as fast as we could imagine. These last weeks, we noticed major achievement on the ITER work site, as yesterday, precisely, the up connection of the vacuum vessel sector number six on the SSET-1, the famous assembly line. And it would not have been acceptable, not responsible, to let three years elapse before IBF in-person meetings again. If we put aside, its remote dimension, the present ITER business meeting will not be less stimulating and fruitful than the previous one, normal IBF. There, there will be fewer presentation, but a hence focus on the business opportunity in the two years to come. Beyond presentation and, quest and question and answer session, we have preserved an essential part of our interaction, the possibility of meeting one-to-one -one with our experts. 2020 was indeed the year of COVID, but it was also for ITER a year of spectacular progress and of renewed challenges. The machine assembly phase has now started in earnest. Beginning in May of last year, we succeeded in installing massive components 
in the assembling pit. The famous 1,250 ton cryostat base, followed a few months later by the cryostat lower cylinder and its corresponding thermal shield in January in this year. Over the past month, the path of deliveries has accelerated dramatically. Six toroidal field coils, over a total of 19, were delivered from Europe and Japan between April 2020 and March 2021. The 400 tons poloidal field coil number six, a European procurement manufacturer in China, arrived in June 2020. And the first vacuum vessel sector from Korea, over a total of nine, Rich Eater in August 2020. And to mention only the largest component, nine toroidal field coil, three vacuum vessel sectors, four central solenoid modules from the US are scheduled for delivery this year in 2021. And to mention only the largest component, we are very pleased to see uh, on the uh, presentation I will show you some visual image of this and other aspect of ITER project progress in a pre-recorded video. ITER, as you all know well, is an immense industrial challenge. In order to raise it, we need your intelligence, your talent and creativity, your capacity to innovate, and your commitment. Throughout our two-day meetings, our experts will reflect on the lessons learned and how they can be applied to the massive work still ahead of us, among them the hot cell complex and the Trisha building, for example. Over the past 10 years, since ITER construction began in earnest, our close partnership has been key to our common success. Let us continue with the same determination. To those of you who already work with ITER, I would like to simply say thank you. Thank you for your commitment and for the effort you contribute to keep the project on track. When the COVID pandemic hit us a little more than a year ago, you developed solutions to overcome the difficulty we were facing and to preserve the health and safety of the workforce while pursuing work, critical work site activities. We would not have made it without you. And to those of you who are yet to join the formidable, formidable ITER adventure, I would like to say that you will not just be providing component or weather complex or services or weather sophisticated. You will be part of one of the most challenging scientific, industrial and human venture of all times. In conclusion, I would like to extend my deepest appreciation to the global network of industrial liaison officers, the famous ILO, who have played an essential part in the organization of this meeting to thank you all for your participation, albeit virtual, in this important event. I wish you a very all a very productive meeting. Now let's turn to a video presentation on the progress of it. It's my pleasure to uh, welcome you to the okay, remote ITER business meeting this year, as you know and to introduce you to the ITER current status. And uh, I'm sure you are quite familiar with this overview, a uh, real view of the work site as it is now. I am pleased to inform you that indeed, we are moving toward First Plasma and we have completed over 72% of the uh, uh, total construction work scope from design for First Plasma. Uh, we are progressing indeed every months uh, since uh, nearly uh, six years of the order of 0.6 percent. Unfortunately, last year it was a little bit less due to COVID-19 and also maybe some industrial issues. So uh, we were in the range of 0.4. You have again the uh, work site progress and you see most of the buildings are now uh, well advanced, except a few of them, which are the central uh, room uh, building, uh, which will be supposed to be by 2022 completed, as well as the neutral uh, beam power supply. This is all as expected to be done before First Plasma. After that, we will have the hot cell complex, as maybe you know. 
I guess it, this picture is quite impressive on the six year uh, progress uh, we have experienced uh, since uh, April 2014 when I came in office where well, the okay, platform was nearly clean and uh, now it's very congested. This is uh, still what we call the detail of the revised construction we are uh, uh, developing since uh, 2016. All the black dot uh, is the milestone or the deliveries which are already done. And as you could notice, we expect that all uh, the uh, deliveries to come uh, and activities to come will be completed for the tokamak by the end of 22, uh, uh, early 2023. And after that, we will have the closure of the cryostat by end of 2024 and uh, okay, the first uh, plasma by uh, end of 2025. Indeed. Uh, it is very, very challenging, as you could imagine. And after that, we will have a stage approach to uh, the deuterium tritium plasma with a successive sequence of uh, completion of, uh, of installation of some equipment. The first one will be uh, the uh, equipment for collecting uh, the, the energy, the fusion energy, uh, the first wall uh, with the beryllium tiles and uh, the diverter. And after that, we will give the floor to the scientist uh, for 18 months in order to start experiencing some uh, helium, uh, hydrogen helium plasma. And after that, uh, we will complete the uh, okay, external auxiliary heating system, including with the neutral beam um, okay, injection. And uh, uh, last but not the least, after we give the floor to the scientist uh, uh, between 2032 to 2034, it will be the opportunity to complete the wall construction with the tritium, uh, what we call the tritium plant for uh, recycling the fuels. Last year, we faced a very big challenge. Everybody knows about it. It's the famous COVID-19 epidemic. We have uh, tried to do our best in order to maintain all critical activities. Never the work site was closed in such a way that we could accommodate as much as we can all the deliveries and uh, preserving the uh, critical milestone to move on. We have adapted with the extraordinary good support of all the team members, including some of our ASEAN colleagues which have anticipated the issues. We are monitoring every week, indeed every day, uh, what are the cases uh, which could be considered as suspected, either as a contact person or they have some symptom of the COVID-19 uh, infection uh, and uh, the, the one which are uh, positively tested uh, as infected. And you know, on the work site is uh, uh, nearly 2,500 personnel which uh, has to be monitored. And uh, you notice that since uh, the early confinement in France uh, in March uh, 2020, up to uh, end of uh, September, uh, beginning of October, it was quite limited number of infection. And after the summertime, when people don't maybe take care in their personal life, social life during the summer, we experience a big spike, uh, which uh, has to be put under control. And now we are more or less uh, okay, uh, preserving the, um, the, system, the site from any infection. Uh, nearly none of the infection we are noticed there uh, have been resulting from uh, activities on the work site, always external. Uh, during this uh, COVID-19 uh, very difficult uh, confinement uh, period, indeed we go on and on working and one of these major milestones we have been able to achieve was uh, to possibility to successfully insert the famous uh, cryostat base uh, within the tokamak assembly pit with all the required okay, geometrical uh, precision. And I want to congratulate all we contribute, the one we manufacture, okay, the cryostat base, the one which manufacture the building and including what we call the famous okay, radiological protection uh, cylinder. Everybody has been fantastic in this respect, including more uh, when we consider we have been able to um, lower the, uh, in the, in the tokamak pit, the cryostat lower cylinder uh, a few months later in 31 of August, and uh, even more recently, we have been able to insert uh, the, um, uh, what we call the thermal radiation protection of the, um, the um, uh, 
cryostat basis. Really very impressive. I am pleased to inform you that very recently we complete the welding of the cryostat base and of the lower cylinder. Uh, the welds has been completely uh, tested, uh, leak, uh, helium leak tested, and so we are now completed. A real major achievement uh, has been, has been uh, okay, uh, performed with this uh, uh, welding. And uh, uh, as you notice on this uh, slide in uh, the right part, we are every day uh, closer to uh, the readiness for accommodating the first uh, vacuum vessel equipped with uh, the TF coils uh, in order to put them on this uh, gravity support, as you see there, and including to uh, lower the first uh, poloidal field coil, number six, which will be sit on uh, the blue support, as you see, which are covered by the plastic blue okay, uh, cover uh, in, in the tokamak pit. As illustrated a few minutes ago with the other side, you see on this uh, slide uh, how uh, we are advanced in the preparation of the first pre-assembly. All components are being now well positioned within the assembling hall, including, you see, the uh, thermal shield, which has been demonstrated fitting very well. You see also the vacuum vessel uh, ready to be uh, uplift and positioned. So really, we do believe we are now on our way to be able to start the full process for uh, the uh, assembling of the first vacuum vessel, the thermal shielding, and the two uh, TF coils before it will be positioned in the tokamak pit, and we hope it will be uh, early September this year. Component delivery are also every day coming. As you see, we receive already six uh, TF coils. We receive, okay, the PF coil number six, the PF coil number five is also ready and the vacuum vessel uh, has arrived. Uh, they are delivered, as you know, through the uh, uh, special itinerary from uh, the Marseille uh, Force Harbor to the uh, Cadarache uh, Eater site with the good support of the French uh, okay, uh, authority, security authority, in order to preserve this equipment, which are like a jewel for us, since uh, it takes nearly uh, five, six years uh, in order to assemble them, not speaking, for example, the time for uh, okay, manufacturing uh, the, the cables, superconducting cables. You notice, okay, uh, uh, in 2021, 2022, we expect much more of these deliveries, uh, the TF coils, and uh, there is still 12 of them which have to come in, the PF1, including the PF1, uh, one which is uh, now being manufactured in uh, Russia, also the central solenoid, uh, the successive modules from the US, the vacuum vessels, definitely from Europe and Korea. So very, very challenging and heavy uh, activities, but uh, we have not only to uh, uh, receive the component, we have also to assemble them. And it's a real challenge uh, to do that. And is why I urge all the suppliers, all the DAs, to now keep on this with this delivery date on site in such a way we could properly organize and optimize the whole activities. I'm sure you are well informed that uh, uh, we feel that it was worth to celebrate the start of machine assembly when we had received all the uh, main component in order to start the assembly, vacuum vessel number six, TF12, TF13, and also the thermal shield. Uh, and uh, so is why we invite all the head of state to express their views about the ITER project. And uh, we thank very warmly all of them. We have accepted okay, to deliver a speech. And I am pleased to say that uh, it was a great momentum uh, for uh, each of the ITER uh, members and ITER staff to see this uh, cohesive expression. But we are not to focus only on the Tokamak assembly. We have to focus also on the balance of plant and you see impressive progress in the cryogenic uh, in component installation, uh, in particular the cryoline in the Tokamak building. It's nearly 5.5 kilometers of them, which have to be installed, and progress is very impressive. And also you see the cold box and the cryogenic termination are now on their way to be uh, uh, activated and commissioned. 
The same with the electrical network. Uh, as you know, we have been able to uh, uh, install all the reactive power compensation system uh, coming mainly from China, very impressive, uh, as well as many other equipment which are now to be qualified and tested. The same also with the electrical conversion system with the bus bar coming from uh, Russia, for example, and you see in the uh, specific building, uh, we have uh, installed all this equipment uh, as well as uh, some also uh, electrical component from in, from, uh, India, uh, Korea, and Russia. Uh, they are ready to go. The same about the heat rejection system, which will be able to cool down nearly 1.2 gigawatt of heat, not only the fusion heat, but also the heat from uh, many of the uh, turning machine, uh, or rotating machine. Uh, and so uh, we expect uh, to be able to uh, commission this equipment this year. Don't forget also very high precision uh, operation and works. For example, due to the nuclear safety uh, requirement, uh, we are obliged to have uh, what we call the vacuum vessel uh, suppress pressure system in case there is a leak in the vacuum uh, vessel and uh, with a uh, lot of steam coming in and uh, we have to remove uh, this uh, steam uh, in order not to damage all equipment. And so there is some tanks which are specifically designed for that purpose. And we have to have absolutely leak test, okay, association of this tank with the building in such a way that even if the okay, tanks is leaking, okay, the trichated material which will be uh, water, the trichated water will be, will be contained in the uh, uh, building. Big achievement also is uh, when we have finished what we call the Tokamak Assembly Preparatory Building, which will be used uh, from 2024 to host the uh, beryllium component and nearly uh, the famous 12 ton, which will be used for the uh, okay, uh, uh, heat collecting system uh, of the first wall. And in the meantime, it will be used for some uh, assembling of equipment of the Tokamak. You are all very familiar with these figures, uh, which uh, demonstrate uh, uh, how many of the stakeholders work all together in order to procure uh, the uh, main component, very innovative component. All these uh, companies are learning uh, to put at the extreme of the capacity of uh, engineering and manufacturing the uh, manufacturing of this component. And you see, for example, uh, in Europe, uh, they are working on uh, the uh, uh, vacuum vessel uh, heat exchanging system. And you see the size of the fellow compared to the size of the equipment. The same of the, on the coils, which are on their way. And uh, including if we have already three coils coming from, from Europe, we expect to have some more very soon also. So polyidol uh, field coils, uh, as sure you recognize on these figures, uh, the uh, lower uh, polyidol field coils, number six, which has been manufactured under the supervision of Europe and procurement from Europe in China. And it is now fully qualified and is expected to be positioned in the Tokamak pit by the end uh, of uh, uh, March, early uh, April. Also on the uh, left side of this picture, you see the coil number okay, uh, two, which is now completed, the 17 meter diameter coils, and uh, the first, uh, uh, the first uh, pancake uh, of the 24 meter. It's uh, quite impressive to see how these uh, different uh, coils will be fitting in order to uh, be able to uh, construct the magnetic edge. Also, very good progress from many countries, as you see from China, which are now delivering the magnet feeders. Also from India, we had delivered okay, the top lid of the cryostat in which it will be weld uh, on the site uh, and close and finish before the end of this year. Japan also is uh, uh, on its way to deliver the coils. Three coils are all the way on site, already on site. The last one arrived 12 of March and we expect some more coming very promptly. Korea, is doing really its best in order to deliver the free more vacuum vessel sector 
And uh, the completion, as you see, is uh, between 86 and 99%. And uh, we expect that the vacuum vessel sector number seven will be arrived on site by June, uh, on latest uh, early uh, uh, July. Russia is completing the PF coil number one, and we expect very soon it will be able to uh, arrive uh, on site uh, to be called uh, tested. And uh, the US uh, has already completed one module of the uh, seven uh, central solenoid module. The second one on its way to be okay, completed, and uh, all this will be uh, okay, uh, tra traveling towards the site very soon. So I'm sure you are all familiar that uh, the fact that uh, ITER is a research facility which will explore many, many uh, of the options which could be done in order to uh, optimize uh, the fusion uh, power in order to deliver okay, uh, fusion with a high yield of uh, 10 times more heat, fusion heat, than the okay, heat we will feed in the uh, plasma in order to have a sustainable plasma. Uh, and so the next step would be an industrial demonstrators and I know that some of the return members are now thinking about that. We have still quite a lot of uh, milestones to come. And for example, the preparation of assembly and installation of all the tokamak component delivery I have introduced a few minutes ago. Very, very challenging. We have in September 2021 uh, to commission uh, the cryo plant, the famous building 51, 52, 53. We have to uh, finalize the conceptual design uh, of the old cell complex by uh, November 2021 this year. We have to commission uh, okay, a twin magnet power conversion building. Uh, I show you a few minutes ago okay, the picture, B32 by January 2022. A completion also the emergency power supply and low voltage power distribution building, B44567. All the service work and service installation by June 2022. We have to complete uh, the control building uh, B71 uh, North uh, Civil Works and service installation by October 2022. Completion of the Trisham building Civil Works and service installation by November 2022 with a good okay, commitment and support uh, of uh, the European Agency. And uh, last but not the least, uh, completion of the neutral beam high voltage power supply building Civil Work uh, and civil installation by March 2023. So it's time to conclude, and uh, I am very pleased to share with you my uh, uh, high appreciation of uh, what has been achieved during this last year, despite the COVID. Everybody has really tried to do his best, working, I would say, nearly day and night to keep the project on track. And I know that we have still a long journey to go, but I am confident we will be successful. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Bernard Bigot, for that comprehensive overview of, uh, of the ITER project status and, and progress. Um, we now turn to uh, perhaps the second most important person when it comes to upcoming ITER uh, opportunities, uh, to Christoph Dorschner. Christoph Dorschner is the, uh, the head of the procurement and contracting division at ITER. He's been that, uh, in that position since April 2019. He will be talking to you in, in a broad general overview of the, the upcoming procurement activities. And you noticed on Dr. Bigot's, uh, one of his last slides, he was talking about the different milestones coming up. So you will begin to see some overlap about the concrete opportunities available for companies. A little about Christoph. Prior to joining uh, ITER, Christoph held various positions in the major oil and gas company, uh, Shell, the global organization, and worked in France, the Netherlands, and Singapore. He started in manufacturing sites as a process technologist, maintenance engineer, and later became a customer service manager before moving into the area of specialty, now contract, contracting and procurement. In the past 15 years, he's held different roles as a global category manager and a procurement operations director for large projects. Christophe graduated from Centrale Paris in France with a Master of, of Science in Engineering. He is also uh, noteworthy, a, a fully qualified member of the Chartered Institute of Purchasing and Supply in the United Kingdom. Christoph will now 
uh, give you a, a pre-recorded video presentation of the, uh, of the overview of EASER procurement activities. I would just note that following this session, we will have a live Q&A. Uh, if you, during this, this meeting, if you're, if you're on the, the ITER uh, 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 watching the channel, uh, you're welcome to submit questions during this presentation. And while we may not get to all of them, depending on the volume, we will do our best to answer our quest your questions in the Q&A session that follows. Thank you. Thank you, Leban, for the introduction. I will give you an overview about the ITER procurement activities. I would like to follow this plan I will speak about the procurement procedure, then the quality assurance program. I will give you an indication about the business opportunity with the IO. I'm sure you're very interested in this one. I would like also to share some hints for successful tendering. And then we will conclude. So let me start by providing an overview about the business principles that we use as an organization. ITER is an international public organization and therefore we follow public procurement rules. Fairness, integrity, accountability, transparency is very important. Effective competition and best value for money is bottom line what we are looking for. The ITER organization is also a first of a kind project so it carries a lot of very demanding requirements in terms of technical capacity and skills. So we look for the best of the industry in order to find the solution and to secure a cost effective and the schedule of the project. The IU is also an installation nucléaire de base, so nuclear installation under the French regulation, and is associated with that a number of safety and quality requirements that we need to be very strict and comply with without any possibility to derogate. Last but not least, we're looking for partners. We're looking for industrial partners with the tokamak scientific knowledge and the industrial know-how that can be matched together in order to find the solution to get the success, the success to the project. Now, a few points about what are we, what are the different types of contract procurement processes that we put in place. Depending on the size of the contract, on the complexity of the activities that we want to put on the market, we have different procurement procedures. All of them are detailed in this website, on this address. You can go there and check out, you will have more details. Today I'm not going to go through the details of all of them, it will be a bit too long. I will further insist on the call for tender specifically and on the open tender. But we can have call for tenders, we can have restricted tender when we are limiting to a few players. We can have a competitive dialogue in which we are building together a certain design in order to get a price. We can go into a negotiated procedure. I will say a few words about that later. We can have call for expertise when we look for very deep knowledge and expert uh, provision of service. We can have request for quotation, which is a more simpler and for less value contract, and we can have open tender. Let's go into more details on the call for tender. The call for tender is a stage procurement process. We generally use it for high value contract. It has three stages. The first stage is a call for nomination, in which the domestic agency is formally requested to provide names of potential candidates. You, you, I mean your company, you will have to apply to that, you will have to express your interest in the domestic agency website, and then once this is known to the, web, to the domestic agency, they provide us with this information and we will add you as a potential candidate in order to get to the next step, which is a pre-qualification. In the pre-qualification, the IU will establish a list of qualified suppliers from the nominated candidates. And in that step, we are verifying the technical and financial capacity of the interested supplier for a specific scope of work. So the qualification is on a specific scope of work. And only those who are technically qualified can go to the next step, which is the call for tender. The call for tender itself will receive, so all the pre-qualified candidates will receive the tender package. So it will consist of instruction for the tenderers, 
the technical specification, the special and general condition of the contract. And from this documentation, you are uh, asked to submit offers in response to this call for tender. Now the evaluation of the tender itself will be done on the two-step approach. The first will be a technical evaluation. So we'll open your technical envelope. Uh, this is done virtually now, but the technical envelope will be open and evaluated. There is an evaluation committee which is set up at the onset of the process and that stays the same all along up to the award. It consists of people from the technical function and people from the procurement function. Also sometimes quality and security or safety officers are included into the evaluation when it is necessary. The procurement function is making sure that the process and the fairness of the process is guaranteed, while the technical evaluation is mostly done by the technical representative. We are setting up award criteria. They are communicated to you in the call for tender. They are fully transparent. We even tell you how much they weight and how much value they represent, each of them. So you are in a position to propose an offer which fits perfectly and comply to those criteria. They will be evaluated in line with those criteria and then a total score of the technical will be given. If you reach a certain level above a certain threshold, which is indicated in the tender, you will be considered for the financial evaluation. If not, you will be unfortunately not considered further and uh, we will send you a declination letter. The second step is a financial evaluation. It's based on the combined quality and price scoring mechanism. So we do an evaluation of your financial, the price, if you want, and we look for the best value for money. So a combination of both the technical score and the financial score will be taken into account to get the winner. Sometimes we, off, we choose a winner based on the lowest priced, technically compliant offer. Not always, but it happens. It is then indicated in the offer, in the tender, sorry, of course. All the results are published and it will be available to you afterward on the IU procurement website here. Open tender. Open tender is a competitive procurement process. It's published exclusively on the IU website. We don't go through the domestic agencies. All the suppliers wishing to participate in the competitive process are invited to do so directly with us. An open tender follows the same evaluation process as a call for tender. It's the same two-step approach with a technical and a financial evaluation. It's a bit faster and it's a way, in a way it's more open. There's no filter of the domestic agency. So this ends my presentation on the procurement procedure. And now I would like to move into the IO Quality Assurance Program. Quality assurance is very important for ITER. We go in this project into R&D, into design, procurement, manufacturing, construction, assembly and installation on the site. And then we'll go into the commissioning of those equipments. And then we'll go into the operation and the maintenance, up to the deactivation of the overall program. This is a long-term journey, of course, and we want to make sure that from the beginning till the end, quality is guaranteed. So we have a very strict and integrated management of the quality. We want to make sure that you can fulfill these requirements. So in our tenders and with you, we will be looking for a number of requirements to be fulfilled. It's indicated in the technical specification we also sometimes require to have specific requirements <coughs> and qualification obtained by our suppliers. A number of them are listed here from the ISO, from the uh, safety requirements, from the specific nuclear safety requirements of the French regulations. The pressure equipment directive needs to be respected, etc., etc. I will come to that a bit later into the tips for tendering, where I will speak about the quality of uh, the quality or what would make a good quality assurance document in a submission to the IO. 
But for the time being, I will leave it like that. And I will move on to describing to you what are the IO business opportunities. So I don't have the time today to give you the full picture about what are the different types of contracts and for which activity there will be opportunities for you. It will be too long. But I would like to give you a broad view in this slide on how much business are we talking about. <clears throat> First of all, over the period of 2019 to 2023, on a yearly basis, IO will be placing on the market between 300 and 600 million per annum. So this is a significant business opportunity for you. We're looking to a broad range of support in terms of services, in terms of works, installation works on the site, in terms of supply contract. I've listed here, I would say notionally, where we would need in the future, in the next two or three years, we will need, require, we will need to have mechanical assembly contract. Later in the day, you will have a presentation on the very large contract which have been awarded already. But that does not mean this is the end you have subcontracting opportunity. And for those subcontracting opportunity, small and medium sized contracts are still needed. In the presentation later today, we will give you the name of the suppliers which have won the contract and the contact points. So you can contact them and maybe offer your services. Second point, electrical supply and installation contract. This is also something that we will, you will hear about today with the power converters presentation from the colleague. Steel structures, piping installation contract. Here again, the largest one has been awarded, but subcontracting is an opportunity. Architect engineering contract, including coordination across large installation work contracts. We have two major sites, I would say sub-plant sub coming to us. The hot cell complex, and Magnus will make a presentation about it, and the detrication plant, which will also be subject to a presentation. Engineering services support contract, the bread and butter of engineering, stress analysis, isometric drawing support, etc., but also very specialized engineering contract. And in diagnostic, especially, Mike will show you what is coming. Then we need specialized components. We need to design them, sometimes to prototype them, then to manufacture them and to supply. This is something that will be coming repetitively. You will see an example of that with the director program presented today. The red waste and remote handling equipment engineering and installation contract for the hot cell is also a big opportunity. Then we will have material supply contracts. We need piping, we need valves, we need MRO components. These run and maintain equipments and components are required generally on a very short term delivery basis. So we are looking for suppliers with reactivity, with capacity to quickly uh, provide us on a short notice this type of equipment. Then when operation will start and after commissioning, we will have to go into maintenance of electrical network of the mechanical and general services. These contracts will come very shortly. You will have a presentation as well during these days on the maintenance strategies that we are thinking and putting in place. Last but not least, scientific collaboration service contracts and IT services contract are two areas where we will have to continue to get new providers, university, laboratories, but also IT companies when our service contracts are uh, coming to an end. This is an overview. If you want to see more details about what's coming next, on this website, you have more information. You can find the list of ongoing tenders. You can find the list of ongoing call for expertise. You can, list, you can see the list of ongoing open tenders, but also we provide you with a forthcoming call for tender picture. You can always ask us questions through this email. And from time to time, we we uh, organize business events on specific subject. There was one organized on the hot cell complex. Information day was organized as well recently on, on the diverter. So we have a number of possibilities here to share more information in depth. Just check out this website. 
I would like also to say two words about the industry liaison officer, which is a network from different European countries who works together with Fusion for Energy in order to raise your awareness about the project and also to provide information to their industry, uh, I would say, um, ecosystem about what is ITER and where do we need, where do we need uh, their support. These people, who they are and their contact details, are, is available on this specific address. I really would like to thank them because they've been a partner in the preparation of this event and uh, we are having regular meeting with them in order to give them an update about the progress and where do we need uh, future support. In the next slides I will show you just a screenshot of what you can find on our website. Here you've got the screenshot of the call for tender you have the tab call for tender with a list of the references, the title of the different solicitation, where we are in the tender process, and what is the cost range that is at stake for this specific activity. The same information is available for call for expertise, as I said, this is a screenshot. Then you can see the same information on the open tender, which open tender is ongoing in green, which one is already closed in red. And last but not least, the forthcoming tender. So this website is updated on a regular basis by my team. It provides you with a range of two to three years uh, of visibility of the next call for nomination publications. And you can see here the date estimated for the publication. So this is an old screenshot, so you still have Q1 2021 for this one the type of solicitation here called for tenders, the title of it, and also the cost range. If you go on each and every line, there will be a bit more details provided behind the title on what is exactly, not exactly, but broadly what is at stake and what is needed. So a short description will be provided to you so you can better position yourself in your strategy within IO. So this is it on the business opportunity. L I would like to say two words on the doing business around ITER. The welcome around the ITER network has been put in place in 2013. It is a very important partner for us because it, it helps you. It helps especially companies who are not used to work in France or in the vicinity of uh, ITER to be better adjusted, to understand the ways of working and to get support from a number of uh, public partners, which are listed here, from the regional agency for innovation, to the job center, to the Agence ITER France, to the ITER Industrial Committee, the Chamber of Commerce, all these partners are, I would say, animated, facilitated by the welcome around ITER. And you will have the opportunity to hear a presentation from them this afternoon and they will go into more details about what type of support they can provide you. So this is important, especially if you're not already working for ITER and you're looking for settling in near ITER. This section will go through the hints for successful tendering. It's an important one for me because we want to give you a feedback. Uh, we want, actually we want you to be as successful as possible in the tender. The more successful you are, the better we are. So this is coming from our experience from a number of tenders where we have seen people doing very good things and others doing less good things. So this is the sharing of the experience. First thing we would like you to recommend is when you form a consortia with other partners, and it is perfectly okay, we understand this is needed when you don't have the required skills or all the capacity in-house to provide the support which we're looking for, you can form a consortium. In this case, it's important and it will be a must for us that there is a several and joint liability which is in place. Be aware that in the case of subcontracting, the main contractor will remain fully and responsible. But in the case of consortia, it's a several and joint liability. Contrary to subcontractors, we would like the consortium members' skills and capacity to be evaluated in the assessment of the offer. 
So we will look at the different partners, what they bring, and we will evaluate them in the pre-qualification and the technical offer based on their capacity as a consortium. When you form a consortium, we want to have this configuration set up at the very beginning of the process and stable along the process. At the pre-qualification stage, we agree the consortium and we qualify the consortium and we would like that the members are staying the same all along the process. Sometimes we understand that things can happen and the business can change and some partners may drop. But it is not something we prefer, for sure, and we would like it to be as much as possible stable up to the contract signature. Second point, smart subcontracting. Subcontracting is fine. We understand that there, when there is a very specialized goods and services required that you do not have in-house, which do not represent the core of the business that you are applying for, subcontracting is perfectly fine. It should not be too much. We would like to restrict it to a maximum of 30%. Be aware that that, that does not include the supply of material, which is not considered as subcontracting. We exceptionally can increase it to 50% if there are some specific conditions associated with the work of the contract, but it's not preferred. <coughs> Subcontracting, and I mentioned that already before, is an opportunity for smaller and medium-sized enterprises. We generally have, we always have lots of questions from small companies who are a bit unsure how to do business with us. And uh, they're unsure about the capacity to let's say, where to, to supply uh, to a very highly technical and sometimes perceived difficult project. But actually, we believe there's plenty of opportunities for you as well as a subcontractor. And we really encourage you to take contact and to take contact with those big contractors that we have already nominated. And you have networks existing as well that helps you through the industry liaison officer to make the connections between your other uh, colleagues in order to form maybe a subcontracting offer or a consortium with a bigger company. Be aware that when you are providing a subcontracting solution, we would like to make sure that you have backup agreements because we want to make sure that whatever the subcontractor life will be, you have the capacity to continue to guarantee the quality and the safety requirements even if your subcontractor is dropping. A third point on the accuracy of the quality plan. So I already mentioned that quality assurance is very important for the I.O. But here I would like to insist on the fact that when we ask you to submit a quality plan in your tender, it should really be very strong on those following points. First, the qualification of your resources, meaning their adequacy in terms of who they are, their qualification, the skills, assigned to the different tasks and how consistent these skills and capacity are and adequate to the organization and to the job to be done is something we look very carefully at. Too often we see quality plans which are very generic and general. We, we are looking for a quality plan which is customized to the work at stake, to the activity of the supply at stake. So we really encourage you to put a lot of thinking on adjusting this plan to exactly what is asked in the tender. Material and equipment procurement strategy should be defined, the supply chain, your capacity in terms of manufacturing, if it is manufactured by you, the qualification you will be using and your quality management. And when you have qualification procedure, they should be fully reliable, especially with respect to welding and non-destructive testing for mechanical activities. Of course, all of that should be done in respect of the ITER Quality Assurance Program. Fourth tip, find the right balance between risks and price. First of a kind means, of course, risk is inherent to the execu execution of an IU contract. Therefore, it's really important that you make an appropriate judgment of that risk analysis and that you have a risk mitigation plan in place as well. That capacity will be a guarantee for us that we have a solid partner which can last with us and do the job up to the end. So how to 
balance the risk and the price is of course a dilemma. In principle, we would like to have sufficiency of price, meaning that you have to build into your price a realistic margin, up to you, depending on your constraint and your capacity, to absorb this risk impact. This is something we take for granted, that it's built into your offer. Nevertheless, of course, do not go to the extreme to overprice and to be really on the safe side, because we are generally tendering competitively with many offers, and that will put you at a disadvantage compared to the competition. I would like also to mention that the creativity in terms of proposing and accepting alternative pricing mechanism to the one we propose is something we always consider. You can make alternative offers. Generally, it's accepted. If it's not, it will be mentioned in the tender document. And there's a possibility for you to uh, take on, take, make proposal of alternative mechanism where you think that the risk cannot be reduced and then we can have a discussion about that. The competitiveness and the consistency of the price that you propose is extremely important for us. We will not be interested to have a price which is too attractive. So for example, if we look at the price sheet that will be provided and we see inconsistency, that it's not coherent, then or is doubtful, we will probably reject the offer or ask for clarifications. So we really strongly request you to respect the price table that we submit to you so we can make a fair comparison between the different players, but also that when you are looking for, if you are pricing very low, be aware that we may reject your offer. If we are not convinced that you can demonstrate the veracity or if we can question the price elements provided based on our benchmark, it is possible that a very low, abnormally low offer will be rejected. So you have to find this right balance between being very competitive, but at the same time, uh, we know we want to work with partners who can make money out of the business and not selling at a cost. It's obvious that you need to submit a technical compliant offer. This is the core of what we ask. The technical specification will give you everything we need. You need to pick and choose and be fully compliant with all the aspects of the, of the, of the specification. And we can accept alternative offers, but you have to pick and choose very wisely where you want to do that. Because if you provide an, ex an alternative offer, be aware that it will be only considered if the tenderer has been selected on the basis of the basic offer, which would respect fully the technical tender specification. So you always need to fulfill fully the technical spec to be considered, and then only your alternative offer will be looked. In case of doubt, in case you have unclarity on the specification or you want to raise the questions, Again, this is something that we completely understand and we really encourage you to do that. Request for clarifications. The evaluation committee will come back to you. We will provide a response transparently and openly to everybody else in the tender. So don't be shy and please use this possibility as we prefer to have a very solid and robust offer from the beginning. The submission deadline is important because this project is going very fast and you have seen the progress presented by our DG and you see that the progress are very, very quick, very fast and every day we need to do something else. We need to install a new equipment. So the schedule of this project is extremely rapid. We have therefore put in place sufficient time but not too much time for you to respond to a call for tender. We understand you need to look into the details but we understand as well that you have to understand as well that we need to stick to the deadline. So the general deadline is six weeks, 42 calendar days. Please respect it. It's important for us. Make sure that when you look at the submission, you distinguish the applicable documents, that the one that has to be read and applied at the tendering stage, which are really necessary for, you, for us to do the evaluation from the others that can be done maybe later during contract execution. And if you have consortium agreements, I think you should also work there 
uh, organization and sort them out prior to the call for tender release. So we avoid a lot of administrative burden afterward during the offer preparation period, and we see that quite often. We know it's not easy to set up a consortium, but we would like, we would like you to would like to encourage you as soon as you're aware that something will be coming to start to contact people and to broker these agreements with your potential partners. Best and final offer, the BAFO process. After a contract award, we have the possibility to invite the winning tenderer to optimize their offer and to submit a best and final offer. This is an alignment process which is important for us because we want to find the perfect match between your offer and our expectation in terms of contract implementation. So that's one possibility. Generally, it's a limited adjustment. We don't want you to redo completely your offer. It's, I would say, relatively uh, small adjustment that can be obtained during this final stage of discussion. But sometimes we have unsuccess unsuccessful tenders. So in this case, we may stop the tender, cancel it, cancel the full process and not conclude on any award. This is always possible. In this event, a possibility, not always the case, but it could be envisaged that we continue the process through a negotiated procedure. In this case, we request the qualified tenderers to provide a best and final offer and go into a negotiated procedure where we will discuss different aspects and find a trade-off between us and you to fine-tune respective aspect on, for example, the payment schedule, the warranty, the liability coverage, the technical specification could be adjusted as well. A number of elements could be changed in order to get to a successful outcome for the IO and for the supplier. So this is the second step of the BAFO, the second possibility of the BAFO after a cancelled call for tender. Of course, we prefer to have clean and straightforward call for tender, but this can happen. We want you to be flexible and to accept that this is something that is, uh, that is uh, valuable for the project and hopefully will be valuable for you as well. Intellectual property is a very key aspect for the project because we want to have all the knowledge developed as part of this project available to all the members of ITER. So as a basic principle, all the IP, intellectual property, developed under a contract will belong to the IO and will be shared with all the ITER members. This is the basic principles. We can use it, we can license it in our respective territories. The license regime will depend on the intended use. What does that mean for you? If you go into a tender with an existing protected intellectual property, you have to make it very clear and visible to us. So it's distinguished from any new generated intellectual property as part of the project. Therefore, we will ask you to provide you that list of existing protected IP. And we will also keep track of all the developments and all the results obtained during the contract execution and making sure that this is generated this is classified as generated IP or foreground IP. Be aware that a contract, as a contractor, you may request to use a generated IP, in which case a license will be put in place by the IO. So this is uh, what I wanted to say on the intellectual property. I would like to say two words about the IO <coughs> logistics service provider, the LSP contract with, trans, with the Trans-Ocean Transport. We put in place in, 2020, in 2010 a single global logistics provider. This was done through a competitive tender and the company Daer has been nominated as a preferred IO transporter. Daer is in charge of transporting all the in-kind components of the machine to the IO site. They do the import formalities, they do the transport between Marseille Harbor and the IO. They do the door-to-door -door insurance and they do that in a safe manner including the guaranteed application of the, uh, the peak safety measures, so the nuclear uh, critical activity measures and critical uh, 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 equipment measures. 
and they ensure that there is an integrated supply chain with one contractor to transport, to inspect, to import, to receive, and to store the components. It is something that you should be aware of. You could use them if you're interested, and we encourage you to use them if you have some doubt about the import formalities or any administrative aspects. This concludes my presentation. I would like to maybe to recap for you uh, what we are looking for uh, as IO in terms of procurement. First, I would like to insist on the fact that if you participate to the ITA project with the IO or with one of our domestic agency, and you will have a presentation from Leonardo on the F4E uh, procurement activities, we believe that the industry will learn and develop a lot of competencies by participating to the ITER. This knowledge and these competencies are critical not just for ITER, but for the fusion next step program. So this is a bigger picture. This is not just about ITER. It's about fusion in the world. And it's about developing capacity and knowledge and companies who will play a role in the future in this area. The ITER project itself and the industry together, we have to find economic and efficient solutions. We know the challenges are great technologically, so we need your best skills. We need your best experience and your best people. And we need to have people with high knowledge in nuclear field and construction. Last, I would say that ITER project is a unique industrial business opportunity for you including for small and medium enterprise companies, either as a subcontractor or directly with the IO. It's also an opportunity for the national laboratories, which are recognized and is an important player for this project. So with that, I would like to conclude to thank you very much, to wish you success if you're interested to work with us, to work for us, and uh, we will be always here to respond to your questions. In the meantime, thank you very much for your attention. And now I'm ready to take any questions or comments you may have on this presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christoph, for that presentation. We are, uh, we are now lucky to have Christoph joining us live here on stage. During the presentation, we were monitoring the questions that you had. We will try to continue to do that during the Q&A. We have 20 minutes or so. That, uh, that we can take additional questions if you have them, but we have quite a number to go into. One is uh, administrative that I would just like to cover. There have been a number of you asking whether our presentations will be available afterward and whether, the, the, whether you can watch these presentations again. So this will be, uh, the, the entire business meeting will be live on YouTube. You can watch it at whatever time you want. And tomorrow, after the end of the meeting, you, we will upload all of these presentations. So you can go in and click on the links, uh, you know, see, the, see the, uh, the, the precise things that Christoph, for example, has outlined on how to do procurement. And for that, that's not on YouTube. That's on the event page on the, uh, on the ITER Public website. If you are there already, you'll see that the presentation's loaded there. For those of you watching now via a different mechanism, uh, just go to www.eater.org and search for Remote Eater Business Meeting, and it will take you directly to that link where those presentations will be uploaded tomorrow. There's one uh, technical question that came in about the hot cell complex that I'm actually not going to put to Christoph. It says, please, what is the expected date for launching the tender for the construction of the hot cell complex? And the truth is, there are multiple important dates. What I would encourage you to do is watch the next presentation because following this one, starting at 10.30, uh, uh, European uh, France time, we will have the, the, uh, the next presentation covering the hot cell complex and remote maintenance in, in some detail, and you'll get those dates from that. So, Christoph, I'd like to start by, by asking you a question posed by Dr. Pramod Rajana, asking, could you please uh, describe briefly the organizations from India participating in this project and their tasks? Sure. So as you know, the ITER project is supported by all the agencies in the country which are participating in this project, the domestic agencies. So we have in India the domestic agency uh, for which uh, we get support for all in-kind supply, but also we get support from them in terms of any procurement activity for which they could provide us with potential suppliers and tenderers. 
So this is what we do through the call for nomination. Uh, India is, a, of course, for us a very important country because it has a lot of capacity to offer. We know India is very strong on engineering activities, very strong on steel mm -hmm. and manufacturing activities. So it's not a surprise to see that we have many suppliers working for the project in the area of engineering services. So we have our contracts with companies like Tata, uh, like uh, uh, like. Uh, Larson and Tubro on mechanical activities and uh, metallurgical activities. They're a big subcontractor in the vacuum vessel welding activities. We have also contract with suppliers who are providing equipments like Inox India, a very strong uh, supplier with whom we're working on various components of the machines, and, uh, and, and a number of contracts on, on software applications uh, with companies like um, HCL Limited. Uh, working on PDM and PLM, but there are we know that there are many opportunities and we're quite interested and quite keen to work with our, our Indian colleagues. Thank you. Um, the next question is uh, a specialized one relating to steels. Which procurement procedure is preferred for specialized steels associated with ITER specifications? Okay, very interesting question. Thank you. I, uh, I like this question because I was actually thinking about it uh, no later than yesterday. Um, so steel in ether is coming in many different forms and where we probably have the, the biggest challenge is when we talk about stainless steel. Yeah. We use a lot of stainless steel in this machine and uh, it comes of course for the largest components but that's supplied by the DAs but we need to supply piping, to supply supports, to supply components for the welding, um, and they all come in terms of stainless steel in 316, uh, the mm -hmm. austenitic grade 316L. Mm -hmm. We have a special grade for ITER because we need a very low cobalt content. And that's probably sometimes difficult to achieve. So the question, I like it very much because let me describe the way we do it today. So today when we buy a component, whether it's a flange, a pipe, or a biscuit to weld on a vacuum vessel, we buy through, from the end manufacturer, so the end manufacturer of the flange, and he will have to take care, that manufacturer will have to have a supply chain to source the right quality of metal that we need. So this is indirect purchase, so we don't control that supply chain. Uh, this is a way, so if the answer to your question is we do it like that. So we don't buy steel directly, if you want. If we need support, we will buy support from uh, another uh, a company who would actually fabricate more support from elements of steel. Now, what could be interesting, but that's just a prospective response, and if you're interested in that, I'm quite keen to hear your ideas on that. We could think of maybe a process where we buy steel directly from a steel manufacturer, and then we will free issue the steel to end a manufacturer, a transformer, who will do the pipe, who will do the uh, support or whatever equipment we would need. That approach would allow us probably to secure a certain capacity mm -hmm. with the right quality and the right grade. And it might be not only cost effective, but also in terms of lead time shorter. Again, this is not the way we do it today. If this model could work, managing the interface and the responsibilities that sits at the interface, which is an issue, uh, but if we can uh, find solutions for that, well, it's probably an alternative strategy that we could consider. So I'm interested. I mean, if you have ideas about that, don't hesitate to, uh, to, uh, to start the dialogue with us. Good. Thank you. And I think that's a good example of what Dr. Bigot was talking about in his opening when he said that part of what we hope to do during this forum, and it's, it's a continuous process, but this, these two days are a concentrated time, is also to listen. Listen to ideas, listen to, to uh, suggestions for innovation. Uh, and I think Christoph just illustrated that. Um, I'd like to, uh, to um, go now to one specific to the UK. Please, can you provide an update on the current position regarding UK company participation in the ETA procurement process? Sure, sure. Thank you for the question. I know we've got many questions from our UK colleagues and, and partners about, uh, about that. Well, it's needless to, to, uh, to explain that uh, after the UK Brexit, 
we have uh, we've been uh, into a, a sort of a, a void in terms of the legal situation. We know that uh, Europe and UK are willing to enter into a cooperation and trade agreement. So this is on the cooking, if I may say. Uh, that agreement, though, is not signed yet. So the protocol of agreement uh, should be signed very quickly. I don't have any clarity, unfortunately, on the date. But uh, this, is, this, is, uh, this is on the preparation. In the meantime, we have decided at ITER that the procurement process that we will be launching and that we have launched since the beginning of this year will include also the UK companies. So if you're interested, you will still be, vis you will still be able to see our call for nominations. You will still be able to see and to participate and offer and, and apply on the F4E website. Your uh, nomination will be coming from F4E to us, we will see it, and we will include you into any future procurement process. So, in a way, it's business as usual, except that I have to be fully transparent. I mean, once we've reached the point where we award a contract to one UK company, well, under the current situation, we would need to go to our governance bodies to get their agreement to do that. That's uh, an additional step uh, that is not existing today. That will disappear once the protocol is signed, but in the meantime, this is what we will do. So this is the situation. Thank you. Um, a specific question about nuclear safety relevant activities. Can you comment on how delegating <coughs> of nuclear safety relevant activities is handled or restricted in the case of a group lead, group members, and subcontractors? This is a complicated question. It's a complicated question and very technical. And I think we need to, we need to be careful. I need to be careful in answering these questions because um, the general principles of delegation of a responsibility into a consortium or uh, where it's a shared responsibility and uh, joint and several liability uh, is, of course, valid for nuclear activity. As far as uh, subcontracting, uh, the same would apply. The general principles where you ask your subcontractor to be responsible, but you keep the liability overall uh, stays the same. Now, as far as nuclear safety, depending on what you need to do and what you actually subcontract, I think it's a bit difficult to answer generally to your question. We need to go into more details to know exactly what activity are we talking about that you want to delegate and whether, according to the regulations, this is something that can be fully delegated, partially delegated, or will stay within the first level of supply chain. So I'm sorry if I can't answer more precisely. Mm -hmm. It would need more details to be able to answer this question. Good. Uh, a related question, not to nuclear safety, uh, but, but liability, again, in a group. Considering that the scopes of contracts now can include design plus manufacturing and installation, how can an engineering company be fully liable in a consortium when together with a manufacturer or installation company uh, paired in a manufacturing contract? Yeah, I guess the question is uh, making reference to what I presented about the consortium where we expect partners to have full and uh, total uh, liability, uh, several liability, as we say in the legal term. Um, that is something that is important for ITER because we want to have, at the beginning, very strong partners in a consortium. So I, I think the first answer to the question is, well, first of all, we want to make sure that whoever you partner with is very solid. And that due diligence that you will have to do before you enter into consortium is very important. We will do the same on our side. But we want to have long-term structures that stay the same along the process. Now, it can happen, it's life, that partner is dropping uh, for some reasons uh, that cannot be foreseen. Uh, it's part of business life. In this case, because it's so important for Easy E to project to maintain continuity, we would expect the other partners of the consortium indeed to take the liability and the responsibility to undertake the work. So if you're a design company within a consortium and your manufacturer is falling apart or leaving the consortium for some reasons, you will have to find the solutions. Indeed, it's a burden on you. And that's something which is important for us. 
uh, you will have to find another partner, make a suggestion, we will be listening, we will be hearing you, finding solution with you uh, for the benefit of the project, or you will have to find a subcontractor who can uh, supplement uh, the facility, uh, the capacity or the skills that you will be missing by, uh, by the contractor. But I understand your question, I understand it's a challenge sometimes, but uh, this is something that can be done through subcontracting or finding another partner, and that's something that you will be responsible for. There's a related question that came in uh, while you were answering these last two, um, and it refers to, I think you can just clarify from your presentation, uh, you said that the subcontracting is limited to 30%. Yep. What about when you have a group of companies, when several companies are acting under one management company? Is the internal subcontracting in that case also is the internal subcontracting in that case also limited to 30% or not applicable in, a, in this situation? Uh, you mean within a consortium? Yeah. Uh, no, of course it's not applicable. A consortium is not considered a subcontracting. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, now, a question about price estimation and, and, and offers. Uh, combining two questions submitted by two different people. Do we, do we have any basis for the price estimation on a tender answer? How can we know before answering if the price is out of limits, too low or too high? And then a separate question, uh, how, do you, how do you identify a quote, quote, abnormally low offer? Okay, so we do have estimates, as you can imagine, uh, like in any project, we do estimates, uh, uh, and we've got a specific department responsible for that. Our estimates are, when needed, updated, and. Uh, upgraded with the latest information coming from the market or change uh, when the design is changed. Um, it's not the, uh, the practice uh, at ITER to share the estimate of a project before it's going to the market. We don't do that. Mm -hmm. We don't do that because we believe that as a professional, if you go into this business and with a proper description of the work, I think you should be in a position to do your own estimate and make an offer. We don't want to tweak the offer coming back through suggesting maybe a target prices that could be either beaten by far and then we're losing an opportunity mm -hmm. if there is an opportunity that you can identify to reduce costs or on the contrary that will be overshoot uh, in the case uh, that indeed our estimate will be maybe on the on the on, on, on the low side that that's not something we do what we do, though, is to share some bandwidth of spend of, of value, as you have seen from the screen I presented before. Uh, but there are bandwidths, they are just ranges, just to give you an idea about the magnitude and the size of the opportunity. So you can better, I would say, uh, strategize mm -hmm. where you want to play, which business are you going for, and which one you're not interested in. Right. But we will not provide the estimate that we have done internally before going to the market for the reason I indicated. Okay. We have a question coming in from Canada saying, since a nuclear cooperation agreement has been signed between ITER and Canada, could you provide the procurement process options available to Canadian companies? Uh, today we are not in a position uh, uh, in the normal process to have our Canadian suppliers participating into the project. They will be considered as a third party as such, uh, the agreement should be given by the governance body. So there's an exception process that exists when a company not part of the participating entities would like to participate into a tender. That is very exceptional, and that will have to be approved by our governing body, the ITER Council. So this would be the process in the case of Canada. Good. One to, uh, one to test your memory. Uh, could you tell me who is the ILO? Uh, for the Czech Republic. We want to contact him in order to help uh, a Czech uh, small and medium-sized entity. Well, uh, <laughs> maybe we can show the slide again. I'm sorry, you will <laughs> hate me for that because I forgot, I forgot his name. Uh, That's no name. problem, but you can also but write. But you, 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 can, you, 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 you can check, I mean, on the list which is provided yeah. with a link, so you can check on all the details will be given as well with the telephone. It appears that I hope the question is not coming from you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just in case, if you have any difficulty with that, you can also write to me at ITER Communication uh, at ITER.org, and I can, I can also provide that. I have the list, but we have uh, quite a number of ILOs, and I, I, I really apologize to my Czech colleague, but um, yes, I can't remember are. the name. Um, 
a question about uh, the UK also uh, specifically came in. Is there a domestic agency for the UK and who are the prime contractors for IO in the UK? And, and the answer to that is, I think Christoph more or less covered it, but the UK will be um, joining uh, as, a, as an add-on to Euratom, much in the same way that Switzerland participates. So there's not a country-by-country -country specific domestic agency. It is the European Domestic Agency, Fusion for Energy. You're going to hear about some of their, uh, some of their uh, procurement opportunities coming up in a presentation later today. So that's the domestic agency based in, in Barcelona. A question, given that ITER IO tenders require installation services with French nuclear qualified installa uh, installers, is there a means within the tendering process to account for the surcharge that such qualified companies would add over perhaps cheaper alternatives? Uh, if I understand the question, so in the tender process, everything is open. I mean, the mean for you to add on a cost that is real, that is existing and unavoidable, would be that you will add this cost to your tender and to your offer. I mean, the, what is important for us is to have a, a fair process. So, I mean, equal, equal level of participation and equal treatment. So, the burden on any French company or any company who would like to work in the French territory with the ASN uh, re regulation will have to comply to it and any cost associated with that will be embedded into the offer. So the mean will be that the price should be including any extra activity from a quality, from a nuclear safety aspect that is needed to comply fully to this type of activity. But that would be the same for all the contractors. So you would have to price it, include it in your prices. Mm -hmm. There are lots of questions when we talk about uh, nuclear-related activities associated about the safety process that you follow, internal qualification. A lot of information is requested and also analyzed by the evaluation committee, uh, and that will be done uh, irrespective of the origin of the, country, of the, of the company. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'd also like to thank Mr. Christoph Ross, who uh, asked the question earlier about steel and was eagle-eyed on, on the check question, so he's, he's put the answer here. For those, if, you, if you ask the question about the Czech ILO representative, it's uh, Peter Brezina, and the, the email address is, uh, for, for Mr. Brezina is given here in the, uh, in, the, in the chat. If you want to look at the chat, you'll find that. Sorry, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the next question, um, can you please share a view of the balance of plant projects that are in the offing and approximately what value of outsourcing in the next one or two years are you looking at? And, and obviously there's going to be some additional detailed presentations on some of those aspects coming up, but maybe Christoph, you'd want to give a general comment. Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's, there's a big tender going on, on on the balance of plant group three, uh, which, is, which is on the way. We have, uh, we have progressed a lot on the balance of plant, and I have to say that uh, now we do have the majority of the balance of plant contracts in full mode, in full throat, or already some of them in the closing mode. Uh, the new ones that we have launched recently is about Group 3. We have uh, a new WC presentation related to uh, other uh, elements of the uh, electrical network, like the power converters that will be presented by Ivone Benfato. Uh, that you will see is a significant and massive amount of component that will have to be installed. Well, that's a few examples of what's coming. Okay. Um, we may have time for one more question. We've got, got about a minute left until we want to start the next presentation. So um, I, I will just ask this. Is there a way to know the concurrent names during the tender process in order to propose a consortium or organize subcontracting? Uh, Take it that would be the names of competitors. No, companies. no, no. We we don't provide this information. Indeed, uh, so you will have uh, you will have indeed to form a consortium with your own network and, and knowledge. Okay. Yeah. So there were a few more questions we didn't get to. Uh, if we can, we'll try to find a way to answer those on the website. But I want to thank you for all the questions coming in. Thank you very and in much. In particular, yes. thank Christoph Dorschner for his uh, very comprehensive and uh, and broad uh, presentation today. Um, I want to go directly now to introducing the next presentation coming up, which is focusing on, as I mentioned, 
on the hot cell complex and remote maintenance. That's going to be provided to you by two people this time, Magnus Goran and Spencer Pitcher. So just a bit about each of them. Spencer is the division head at ITER responsible for the hot cell complex and remote handling and rad waste. He's worked on many technical aspects of nuclear fusion research and development since 1980 in, in multiple countries. And he is one of those among us who joined the ITER project at its start in 2007. Magnus Goran, by contrast, uh, just uh, joined the ITER team about a year ago. He's the project lead for the hot cell complex and will have some specialized uh, discussions to give you <clears throat> in his presentation. He's got an extensive background in nuclear projects around the world. For the last 10 years, he's been the project lead for the European Spallation Source, ERIC, ERIC, the hot cell design and construction. So I would like you now to, uh, to turn your attention to the video recording of their presentation. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to introduce to you uh, the ITER hot cell complex. Um, ITER, as you know, is a nuclear fusion reactor, the world's uh, first, um, but it also will be the world's first hot cell that supports a nuclear fusion reactor. So it is a first of a kind, just as the Takamak reactor is a first of a kind. Um, <clears throat> so to remind you on the Takamak, um, inside the Takamak we have many components that need to be maintained or discarded. Uh, these are facing a thermonuclear plasma, so they are gradually damaged or eroded. Um, we have the blanket modules, the cryo pump, uh, the, upper, the various port plugs, and the diverter, amongst several other things that need to be maintained uh, in our ITER hot cell complex. I want to give you first an idea of the, of the schedule for this hot cell complex. What you see here is the overall schedule of either project taking us up to nuclear operation in, in 2035 or 36. Um, we have first plasma. Hot cell is not needed for first plasma in, in 25, but it is needed at the start, start of uh, beryllium operation in about 28 or 29, 2028 20, or 29. At that point, we have a beryllium risk and we need the hot cell complex uh, to deal with that beryllium risk. Um, so we'll have several years of uh, plasma operation without uh, tritium, without a strong nuclear risk. Not, not zero nuclear risk, but very small. The main risk being beryllium. By 2035, 36, we start to introduce tritium into the operation. And then we have a, a nuclear risk and for sure the hot cell is needed um, in all, all aspects of the hot cell by that point. Now, <clears throat> some of the, these are some of the components that I mentioned that need to be maintained inside the, inside the hot cell complex. These are inside the Takamak uh, in vessel components. You can see the various flavors of port plugs, uh, heating port plugs, diagnostic port plugs. Um, and you can see the, the size, the largest one there being the equatorial port plug, uh, about 50 tons and several meters in dimensions. So a very substantial uh, component. It's activated by the thermonuclear neutrons of the plasma and also contaminated with uh, dust from the Takamak and also um, uh, the tritium. One of the unfortunate aspects of a fusion device, it's a very efficient at generating dust. Uh, atom by atom, we're eroding the inside walls of the reactor, and this uh, results in dust, which we have to deal with if we try to do any maintenance. And of course, we will have to do maintenance. Um, we have other components as well, cryo pump and diverter cassettes in particular, because we plan to change all of the diverter cassettes at some point in the future. Those components are brought um, from the Takamak in these remote handling casks, these big blue boxes that are the size of a large bus. Um, and they, it's a robotic operation because these casks do not provide shielding, but they provide confinement. So they drive through the building, typically in the middle of the night, depositing the equipment um, in the hot cell complex. Okay, so I'm going to introduce the current hot cell design so you have a feeling uh, for the um, size and the complexity of the equipment in the facility. Before that, you can see, uh, this is a picture from the headquarter building, a little bit old, but it does show the Takamak complex in the distance. And in the foreground, you see the hole in the ground where the hot cell complex will go. Um, in fact, that hole at the moment is too small. We'll have to enlarge it. Uh, this is a similar perspective uh, showing what the completed facility would look like. Basically, a big concrete box, a nuclear building. And adjacent to that, um, uh, so the hot cell is building 21, beside that is building 24, which is a support building for change rooms and control room and such. Okay, so <clears throat> these large boxes I mentioned um, drive through the Takamak complex and then into the hot cell complex. 
we share the Takamak cargo lift, so we come to various levels between the Takamak complex on the left-hand side and the hot cell complex on the right-hand side, um, and different levels of the building, we perform different functions. There are five levels uh, of the hot cell complex, um, uh, two below grade and three above grade. All right, so <clears throat> the heart of the hot cell complex is the L1 level, um, and the heart of the, of the facility is this refurbishment room that you see in the middle. Um, this is the location where we maintain the in-vessel components or discard them. On the bottom left, you can see where the cask enters the hot cell complex. It, it drives into the large corridor, corridor and docks on the facility. Um, we have to deal with the dust, so we have a so-called cleaning cell. Um, we don't want to spread dust. We want to minimize that. It's radioactive and contaminated with tritium. In the refurbishment cell, we'll, we maintain the components. If we discard them, they go to the top of the, of the figure to an area called the type E detritiation and processing area, where we detritiate this rad waste and reduce the volume and package it. But I'll, I'll go into more detail about that. The basement level, um, at the top of the figure, we pass the waste, the type B waste, from above uh, down to this level, level, where we continue processing, we package it, we cement it, and then we pass it down to the bottom level, which I'll come to. At the bottom, we have um, the port plug test facility, where we test port plugs after maintaining them before they go back onto the tokamak. And in the bottom left, we have a liquid rad waste area, which I'll, I'll talk a bit more about. At the bottom level, as I mentioned, the pa waste packages at the top go down to the basement, and they're stored in this type B P basket storage area. The bottom portion of the, of the floor is devoted to the maintenance of the remote handling equipment that goes inside of the tokamak. Um, this equipment comes out, it's not exposed to thermonuclear neutrons, but it is exposed to the dust, so it is contaminated, and the equipment is maintained hands-on. So we have to decontaminate it, um, and then we have to uh, clean it up, prepare it for its next usage, and also, of course, we have to test, and that's a big part uh, of remote handling is testing and testing before you actually go into the reactor. Uh, top level, um, mostly building services, but also there is a type B processing area for the low-level rad, sorry, type A processing area for the low-level rad waste and some support labs for assessing the, the uh, rad waste that we have. Um, and then the very top floor, again, building services, but also an area, quite a large area, dedicated to the maintenance of equipment coming from the tokamak, but not from in-vessel, but from ex-vessel. It's only slightly activated, it's only slightly contaminated, but it has to be in a controlled area, and the top floor, or a big portion of the top floor is dedicated to that. It's a hands-on area. All right, now, the main systems um, in, the, in the procurement for the hot cell complex, um, most are, in fact, I.O., the in vessel maintenance of the in vessel components, that's ITER. The maintenance of the tokamak remote handling equipment, um, this is ITER. The type, B, the, the type B, the purely treated waste, and the very low level waste, TFA, is all IO. Um, with respect to um, the low level rad waste, uh, officially at the moment, this is an EU procurement, but we have been discussing discussions for a long time and agree that this will be transferred to the IO. Um, the air detritiation system that I didn't mention um, is a big part of the facility. This is a combination of IO and Japan. The port plug test facility is a Russian Federation uh, contribution. In fact, it's already passed its FDR, final design review. And the big one here, of course, is the building, which is an EU contribution. Um, and at the moment, we're working on this conceptual design with a conceptual design review planned uh, later this year. Okay, now I will go on to discuss um, some of the IO procurements related to the remote handling and the rad waste. Okay, so <clears throat> what are the key functions of the hot cell? Well, um, the maintenance of the tokamak components, the maintenance of the remote handling equipment that is used to maintain the tokamak components, and then um, the buffer storage or the maintenance of this ex vessel equipment, so-called port cells, which is only slightly activated and only slightly contaminated. It is the facility for dealing and processing with all, or restoring, all of the rad waste, the low level, the very low level waste, the TFA, low level waste, TA, the type A, the intermediate level waste, the type B, the purely treated waste, and the liquid rad waste. Remind you that ITER is a water-cooled uh, tokamak reactor, so there will inevitably be uh, liquid uh, waste that we'll have to deal with. It's also the import-export facility for equipment coming in or waste going out. And it's also the area that we use for the remote handling uh, control rooms. All right, uh, so a little bit more focused on the equipment now, IO procurement. 
Um, this is the refurbishment room, as I said, is the heart of the facility. And you can see various areas. On the right, you see the reception where the components are coming from the tokamak. Uh, on the far left, you see the so-called tilting tower. This is where we take the port plugs, we upend them to be able to take the modules out of them. So this is a very big operation, of course, because this port plug can be up to 50 tons. Um, and then we have these so-called universal workstations where we maintain the modules. And this is, of course, this is a red zone. Um, so it is hands off, there's no people here, everything is a remote operation in itself. At the bottom, we have this buffer storage where we put components which we consider waste um, and until we can process them in the, in the, in the northern portion of, of this floor. I'll come to that in a minute. Uh, this is the cleaning cell. Uh, what you see here is an upper port plug um, in position to be cleaned robotically. Uh, there's a person in the figure, but that's just to give scale. Um, this area is where we, may, we clean up the component um, uh, to control the dust before we open it to the uh, refurbishment room. There's a bit more about the tower. This is a very large piece of equipment. Um, on the bottom left, you see an equatorial port plug, a 50-ton component, several meters in dimension. We, we pull the modules out. We put them down into uh, the stands, which are on the right, uh, for, for maintenance activities at the Universal Workstation. Um, moving on uh, to uh, the basement, this is the area where we maintain the robotic systems that go inside the tokamak. Um, uh, you'll see initially the component, the, the, the cask with the remote handling comes into this facility. Again, we control the dust. Eventually, uh, we maintain the equipment and eventually we move it to the testing area. You can see the scale of the testing area here um, in the facility. It's very large. It's meant to mock up the activities of the diverter remote handling system. So what you see uh, at the bottom here is the uh, mock-up of the diverter. And then it's also meant to test the blanket remote handling system. Um, and so we have a mock-up where the blankets are maintained. Very important to do this testing before you go inside of the reactor. We don't want a failure uh, inside the reactor. In the northern portion, the top of the figure, the northern portion of the facility is where we treat the, uh, the type B rad waste after it's discarded. So for example, a diverter cassette. We have size reduction occurs first. So we have two means of doing this. Through the ceiling in both cases, we have wire cutting, basically to take the, let's say a diverter cassette and chop it down to something a bit smaller so that we can handle it either, well, either to detritiate it or to actually box it. Um, we also have another, the other method of reducing size is milling. So we're performing R&D on this and uh, this is an approach that we would like to take, basically milling some components down uh, to practically nothing. Um, okay, so once the, the waste has been reduced in size, uh, we put it into boxes. These boxes are of order a meter or a meter and a half. Um, and we have a transfer uh, of this box uh, down to the floor below. Okay, in the, in the floor below is where we cement it and we lit it. Um, and then it goes down to the storage, as I mentioned uh, earlier. As I, also, as I mentioned, we have the liquid rad waste. So an uh, eater can have a loss of coolant inside. We hope not, but it might happen, so we have to be prepared for this. And generally, we just have some liquid waste coming from the water cooling system. Um, so this area is dedicated to that. I won't go through all the details of this figure, um, but it shows it's a process flow diagram. It has various features, some very large tanks, hundreds of cubic meter tanks, uh, various processing. Generally, our approach is to evaporate the water and then take what's left over and uh, either um, cement it or if, in fact, the condensate, the, the, the water, uh, typically would have tritium and it has to go to the water detritiation system in the tritium plant. It's a rather complicated um, process and we are trying to account for all the various um, uh, export paths for this waste. One of the export paths, of course, after evaporation is to have uh, dry um, dust, which we would in fact cement and it would become uh, to go into the type B rad waste stream. Um, a little bit more detail about the liquid rad waste. Uh, ultimately, these can the dust would go into a canister, um, into a patarac, and be transferred into the type B processing. On the second floor, we have the uh, type A rad waste treatment. This is an area where we uh, detritiate the rad waste, package the rad waste. Oftentimes, it's just the housekeeping waste uh, contaminated at a fairly low level. Um, this shows this area. We have um, a buffer storage area. We have some characterization, x-ray and gamma spectrometry. 
we have detritiation going on. Basically, we take this waste and we heat it. Um, then we package it and we cement it. Um, it's not the, so in addition to the cementation for, we, for the type B red waste, we also have cementation um, at this location here. All right, so that's the end of my, my talk. And now um, uh, my colleague, uh, Magnus, will present the procurement strategy for the, for the hot cell complex. Thank you very much. Thank you, Spencer. <clears throat> so uh, before I start my presentation, I'm just going to mention that um, uh, the procurement strategy that we are thinking about for the procurement of the, uh, the hot cell packages is a collaborative type contract. Uh, there are no um, uh, signed agreements or, or, uh, or any, any decisions taken, so, so it's still work in progress, so keep that in mind when we go through this, this uh, presentation. So uh, from there I will actually dive directly into the current schedule as we see it. Um, the the um, conceptual design as uh, we are currently preparing uh, and, and shown by, by Spencer in the previous talk uh, will end in, uh, let's see, let's do it like this. Uh, the top part here uh, will end in, uh, in uh, uh, the end of 2021 with a conceptual design uh, review as well as we see a facility review combining a number of, of CDRs uh, into one uh, um, uh, baseline that we will form a technical baseline at that facility review. Um, taking off from, from the technical baseline, we then have to pr proceed with, with a safety review um, that has to be based on, on, on the technical baseline. So that is uh, lagging a little bit behind, uh, stretching into uh, around May uh, time in 2022. So then uh, we, uh, in the interstitial time in between, we then uh, uh, start our, our procurement efforts. As you can see in the yellow bars, uh, we have one contract that is placed by FRE, uh, which is uh, should be on the on open for for uh, for uh, tenders uh, to to in, in a very short uh, time frame if it's not al already open. Uh, and then we have uh, first of all the project integrator, as we see uh, as one of the main contracts within the collaboration. And then there's a staggered approach for for the remote handling, the rad waste, the building services, the, the civil works, and and the other procurements as as uh, they eventually together will form the, the the collaboration. So in the green bars on the bottom, uh, you can see um, the 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 collaboration uh, establishment, if I put it like that. Uh, we're starting now and we're working internally here to, to, to produce the procurement strategy and, and, and what that should contain and, and how, how, we, how we structure the full, the full collaboration. Uh, and then uh, we then match that to start of the uh, uh, procurement of the product integrator. Um, we are then also going to do a scope allocation for the, for the other contracts as well as we uh, elaborate on, on, on the collaboration and how we, we would like that collaboration actually to work eventually. Uh, this is, the, is then matched to the start of the uh, uh, preliminary design. Um, so you can see there's some, some hatched uh, bullets up there. So, so we're basically in this uh, schedule, we're building a hole in between the, the end of the uh, conceptual design to the start of the preliminary design. And, and we think that is a pragmatic uh, way of doing it because we would like to have the pro product integrator come uh, in first and actually establish the, the, the uh, f fundament, the, 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 the glue to the, to the collaboration before the other contracts uh, come on board. But we also see that as a part of, of, of possibly the, the, the preliminary design. So, design. so that is why it's hashed in, in that sense. If we continue on the green part down in the bottom, um, we see that um, we have something we call the formation and, and uh, validation and appropriation and, and, and different milestones in polyparty agreements. So uh, we, we see that this is a stepwise contract. Uh, we will do it in, in, in batches. So for each batch, there will be a possibility to, to formulate the uh, agreement going forward for, towards the next stage of the contract itself. Um, so if I combine that schedule with this scheme of how we are seeing the, the, the uh, collaboration pr pr progressing through, through time, 
Uh, just to point out that this is not a schedule, but we have to combine this slide with the schedule to get the full picture. On top here, we have the uh, activities basically. So we are in the beginning uh, of the activities over over there, the client uh, part of it. So th this is what we're doing uh, right now. We're 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 uh, defining the collaboration as such. We will then have the procurement starting. Uh, we will have an validation appropriation phase uh, in, in, in line with, with our uh, version one of the polyparty agreement uh, um, uh, establishment, uh, as well as the scope allocation. Then we're starting the design efforts. And um, uh, that is then going on. And as you can see, we have all the participants up from the, the, the um, collaboration planning version one in this scheme. So this uh, scheme actually covers everything uh, up until the commissioning and handover. If we go down uh, one row, um, the collaboration as such, we're seeing that as uh, on a cost plus fee plus incentive scheme. Um, we will match that, if we're jumping down to these stars here, we will match that to, to certain, we call it golden milestones or, or, or um, a, a defined endpoint for a specific phase uh, where, we, where we will see that we have to, to strive for schedule and cost to a certain breakpoint and then from there we can f reformulate the agreement as well as uh, uh, formulate the next step of this um, uh, ongoing work. Uh, it should be mentioned also that these uh, milestones can also be breakpoints for um, certain contracts within the collaboration. There's an exit for the companies, but it, there's also an opportunity for, for the clients to, to, to have an effect on the, on, the, um, on the project at these points. Um, so uh, also to mention in, in this uh, orange bar that we also can see that there is potential for lump sum uh, contracts. If we have a very defined scope for a specific set of, of uh, deliverables, uh, there is a possibility to also do lump sum. Uh, I, for one example, we can see that the excavation, the site preparation could be such one case that we actually can do uh, outside the collaboration um, as, a, as a sort of a risk mitigation, but also uh, lift that off schedule and so forth and so forth. It's really uh, um, the detailed plan that will show where we have these opportunities. The green bar, we see the, the uh, different collaboration types. So uh, if we connect that to, to the blue bar here, where we have the most of the, um, the money spent, uh, of course, in the end, because we have the construction, and go, but we also have some money spent already at this point. We have some, some uh, smaller contracts ongoing, helping us basically setting up these uh, procurement uh, efforts. We already spoke about the breakpoints. Um, uh, the next line here with the stars is really the, the client stage gate. So of course there's going to be a lot of stage gates, uh, uh, making sure that we fulfill the, the expected design at a certain time. Uh, that will also be a, a, a control measure for the clients to see that the deliverables are according to plan. Um, and and uh, the last line here is really uh, to also control that we are on schedule and, and, and cost. We, we are implementing something we call design to cost, so we will have regular um, uh, uh, making sure that the design actually follow the, the cost propagation as planned. Uh, th these are, we're trying to uh, show that, but these, these smaller stars, uh, that that is an ongoing activity that will uh, loop uh, with the design going forward. So if we go a little bit more in detail of how we see this um, collaboration structured, um, we, uh, we see the collaboration as sort of inside a, a fence. I'm trying to build a, a, an image of how this would work. So we have a fence here and within that fence, there's going to be a certain number of functions. Uh, these functions will have a certain amount of, of independence uh, in order to be able to achieve the, the cost and schedule targets. Uh, we have also to let the collaboration to have a certain uh, degree of freedom and we, we have to decide on, on, on where that freedom is and how much and, and so forth. 
Um, but we also then, on, on outside this, this fence, we also have a control function uh, from the nuclear uh, operator and, and the clients on, of, of this project. So we have to make sure that that interface is working properly uh, in, ter in terms of configuration management. We have to make sure that we fulfill the nuclear requirements, the quality goals and, 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 and uh, everything that comes with, with, with the client side of these things as well. Um, so up uh, to the, the far uh, corner of the presentation, we also have a number of third party su support contracts, as we call them. Uh, we would like to have an external uh, set of contracts that actually control both the collaboration, but also the client to make sure that we, you know, it's, it's a balanced and fair game uh, w between the client and the collaboration itself. This should be independent uh, uh, companies and people that, that actually review, audit uh, and, and control that we are doing what we're supposed to do. We also see support owner, uh, maybe site service, and we can place a number of, of contracts here basically to support both the client and, and the collaboration itself. It's also important to, to mention here that uh, the clients um, have a client role, so which, which is a control role, but the clients will also have people embedded inside uh, the collaboration. Uh, that is to support and make sure that uh, we have a, a good knowledge transfer between the clients and, and, and the collaboration itself. We can also see here that we have, um, it is not written, but tier one, the, the, the darker red and tier two companies. So uh, we can see these companies as, as groups of companies or, or consortia or, or however, um, the, the industry would like to, to, to uh, um, form these, these groups. Um, it is important though to, to point out that we would not like to see a consortia form that will have an impact on how we can operate the collaboration. So we, we, we would like to keep the, the, the collaboration in, in charge and have the balance of how things uh, proceed and progress. We can also see that it's a possibility for companies to bid on several of these packages. However, we are also conscious about that the balance within the collaboration is important. So we cannot have one player that is uh, overly strong to, to the others uh, to shift the balance within the collaboration in, in an unfavorable way. Going to the next uh, slide, uh, uh, going into a little bit more depth about uh, uh, what these um, uh, major roles within uh, the collaboration is. So first of all, we have the client and nuclear operator. Uh, we form a steering committee with that uh, entity. And um, uh, one of the roles which we are currently doing, uh, except for being owner and nuclear operator, is of course to deliver the concept design. So this is really the start point for, for uh, the collaboration itself. Um, so it, with that, we also then form the first program baseline, uh, of course, containing scheduled costs uh, and, and basically hand over a package uh, that is then um, taken over uh, by the, the, the collaboration and also taking responsibility for these, these inputs that we, we uh, hand over to, to, to this group of people. Uh, of course, there's also, and that's connected to the nuclear part of it, we, we, we are responsible for the quality program and we have to have a, a follow that, uh, which is then an, an, an input and an impact on the collaboration itself. And we, uh, as clients, also retain control, uh, uh, but we also there to, of course, to, to uh, be uh, working with issue resolu resolutions and helping the collaboration to, to, to proceed in progress. So then within uh, the border, the fence, as I described it, we have a collaboration board and a collaboration management team. We see the collaboration board as, as um, uh, participants that represented of typically senior ex executives from, from all the different participants. Uh, and they're there to provide guidance, uh, set policies, monitor performance, uh, the high level le leadership, and, and, and also, of course, issue, is, issue resolution. Um, we are very conscious about uh, that we uh, need to have uh, all, all, all the time with us that uh, there is a best for project decision uh, process. 
So it shouldn't favor uh, one participant, it, it shouldn't favor uh, anything specific, but it should favor uh, the, 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 the whole project as a, uh, as a whole, which means that the whole project will have to work towards one common goal of delivery on, on time and schedule. And, and um, uh, we also then, of course, there, there is an accountability here as well. So, of course, we see the collaboration board as the co uh, accountable uh, board for uh, towards the clients uh, and the operator owner. Uh, this entity then, of course, also then report to the client steering uh, collaboration. Then the collaboration management team. This is really the day-to-day -day, uh, running team. Um, all the participants are represented. Um, we we have what we call the the uh, it says alliance manager, a collaboration manager, um, and and it's it's uh, basically day-to-day -day management and leadership. Uh, we also here have a level of decision making. Uh, again, best for project uh, practices have to be applied on this. And they, of course, then uh, report to the collaboration board. Uh, going in uh, to the next level, the integrator. Uh, the first bullet there is, is one of the, I would say, most important uh, bullets, maybe. It's behavioral role model. Uh, we see that behavior within the collaboration itself is extremely important. And th this is something that we actually will assess the companies coming into this on. Uh, so if we have a common uh, basis for behaviors within uh, this, this group that will perform this work, I think we are a lot better off actually delivering as well. So uh, we will have to set some sort of behavioral standard for, for, for the whole uh, team going forward. Uh, I've described the different phases uh, of the project and, and therefore also the integrator, the product integrator will have to follow these phases. And if I take a, an example, when we start construction, there's a lot of site coordination. And, uh, and uh, when we go into installation, there's a lot of coordination that has to be done that hasn't to be done in the beginning of the project. So this is the integrated role as well, the, 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 the coordination on site. Uh, so with that, the, the role actually will change uh, throughout. Um, we, we will see the integrator as, as, of course, controlling the technical and program baselines. Uh, with that, there's a, a configuration management, there are tools, there, there's, there's ways of working, and, and, and we are expecting the integrator to come with, the, with the, their know-how and, and, uh, and their processes and procedures. Somehow we have also to make sure that the interface towards the I.O. control part of this works. So there's that one of the reasons to why we would like to see the integrator coming in uh, about six months before the other contracts to make sure that we actually can set the, this whole model up uh, before the rest of the contracts come on board and we can actually start delivering a, a preliminary design. Uh, we have other bullets there as lead and integrate uh, issue resolution again. Um, we are uh, prop lead propagate safety requirements as well as all requirements and may also make sure that we validate. Uh, they will be responsible for uh, um, buildability, RAMI, standardization, um, design to cost, value engineering, uh, risk management and so forth and so forth. Um, uh, the, the integrator will, will also be responsible for um, uh, making sure that we can have the stage gates uh, in time uh, and, and involve the clients because here the client has a control part and role so that we can actually uh, do these stage gates in, in, a, in an effective way. So uh, this is my last slide, uh, so sort of a short summary and conclusion. Uh, we do, I've showed you uh, a, a timeline for us. Uh, the timeline here is very important. Uh, we, we see that we uh, have to start the procurements of the product integrator uh, in the middle of the summer. There's quite a bit of work we have to do to actually achieve that uh, position when we can start a procurement, but this is really what we're aiming for. This is tied to the conceptual design review and facility review in the end of uh, November, um, um, and, and uh, then going forward from that. Um, we, I've also showed you about the strategies and, and the different project phases and how we see this collaboration uh, develop with time. Um, and I also explained to you the governance and roles um, 
and with that, I thank you so much for, for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Spencer and Magnus. Uh, we appreciate the overview that you've given us of the hot cell complex, the remote maintenance, etc. Um, we have some time now for a question and answer session. Uh, we have time until about uh, 1130 France time. We'll then take a break for 15 minutes and start our next presentation on the, uh, the tritium plant at 1145. So feel free to, uh, to submit your, your questions. I see some coming in. Uh, there was one that came in during the presentation. It's actually uh, from Mario Schweitzer. It's, it's a um, sort of a dual question. Uh, where is development or design of robotics systems required, and what is planned to be handled via COTS robotic systems? Yeah, so I'll answer that. Um, so as you saw in our presentation, we have a lot of remote handling systems uh, within the hot cell complex. In addition to that, we're using robotic systems to maintain robotic systems that are also coming from the tokamak. Um, they are all contaminated, uh, not activated, but contaminated. So. Um, we have a combination, in fact, of off-the-shelf equipment um, and also custom-designed equipment. For example, those of you who are familiar with such equipment know about through-the-wall manipulators. If you look carefully at the presentation, you saw that we have many of these. These are very large um, motorized systems, and they will be more or less off-the-shelf, I would think. We may have to have some customization related to tritium confinement. It's not the usual problem that you have with these equipment. Uh, uh, normally, but in ITER we have this tritium confinement issue. We have other types of, of manipulators that are used for cleaning the components. You may notice these sort of uh, uh, bicycle pedal robots. These would be custom designed, but in themselves would have off-the-shelf equipment, the connectors and things like this. Um, and this design activity, while well, we're already in it at the conceptual level, and this will continue for several years, and in fact we'll start building prototypes uh, probably in about three or four years uh, to be ready for installation at the end of uh, uh, in, in about 10 years or so. So it's a mixture, I would say. Wherever we can, of course, we prefer to use uh, off-the-shelf components. Okay. Thank you very much. We have uh, two questions coming in that are somewhat related. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask them both. Uh, one from Alberto del Castillo. Magnus, what conflict of interest is foreseen between the major roles within the hot cell complex collaboration and from Xavier Faucher saying, we have not seen much in writing so far concerning the collaborative approach. This is in some ways limiting the industry to reach intercompany agreement. When do you think you will be able to communicate in writing draft contractual terms on the contractual schemes that IO and F4E desires? Thank you. Um, as it's pointed out in the question, uh, we are two clients to this um, uh, the, the procurement strategy on how we will conduct the, the, the procurements, and therefore we have to be very certain that the the um, strategy that we eventually come up will, uh, with is is adhered to and, and, and accepted by all the the, the stakeholders and the clients. So um, it is a little bit hard to predict exactly when we can start uh, distributing this, but we, we uh, are aiming at least for um, starting, as I said in my presentation, to, to start the procurement of the product integrator in the summer. We might not have uh, enough information at that point to actually distribute the procurement strategy as is at that point, but that is something that have, has to be developed uh, a bit further. Um, uh, leading to uh, what I also showed in the, in, in the presentation, uh, the other um, uh, procurements that is then going to be staggered and staged from, from, from end of this year. Uh, we at that point have to have that procurement strategy uh, done and ready because uh, it is not a, a, um, a pragmatic thing to go ahead with those procurements without that in, in, in hand. So, so we are diligently working with it. Uh, it will take some time more and, and, and we will uh, eventually distribute it, yes. Thank you. Um, a couple of questions that are somewhat related, but, uh, but uh, maybe a little bit more specific. Can you confirm that companies or entities will be able to support the hot cell complex at the integrator level and tier two? Um, the, as the way I see it, I, I don't see anything that, that is hindering that. Um, the, 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 the important thing here uh, is that we have to make sure that the collaboration uh, itself is a functioning uh, uh, setup. 
So if you have, if you have the role as the product integrator, uh, you may very well uh, be part of a t sort of a tier two or tier three um, uh, group of companies uh, contributing to some other lot in this uh, uh, setup as well. What we are cautious about and, and what we will try to, to, to mitigate is that one company or, or, or one group of companies have a very, very strong position within the, the, the full collaboration. So, so um, I, I say this with a bit of caution uh, because we, if the if the scale is weighing too too much far to to one group of companies or one company, then then uh, that might be uh, a problem for the collaboration itself to actually functioning the way we are uh, are thinking about the, the, the functioning part of it. Thank you. Um, I'm going to combine two questions. Some are taking off from this same topic of integration and so forth. Uh, first one. Can you explain again how Fusion for Energy and the ITER organization will work with the integrator? Uh, who will be the integrator's client? Can the integrator also uh, be a tier two? And then separately, is it your intent that the successful project integ integrator will participate in the conceptual design review? So we have not seen the, um, uh, starting from, from the last question, uh, we have not seen the, the integrator uh, being part of the conceptual design. That is actually it's a delivery from uh, the ITER organization to start the preliminary design of the, of the project itself. And then, uh, um, sorry, you have to come then back then to the the It's a bit complex, but can you explain again how Fusion for Energy and ITER organization will work with the integrator? Okay. Who, who will be their client? Yeah. And, and can the integrator also be a tier two? So we do not see the integrator as such as tier two. Tier, the, the integrator is a tier one uh, company, the way we see it. Uh, it has a very um, broad role within the collaboration because it has to interact with all the, the, the other tier one companies. So we really see that as a tier one. And, and for the client part, we, we see that uh, it is acknowledged that we, we are two clients. So it's, it's the ITER organization, it is a free. So we have to deal with that somehow. And, and that is done on the client side. So the integrator should only see one client. So it shouldn't, it shouldn't have an impact that we are actually two clients behind the scenes, so to speak. So effectively, what I and FRE have to do is to, to have an MOU that, that combines our efforts so to make sure that, that, that our face towards the, 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 the collaboration is uh, anonymous. It, it, yeah. No, sorry, is it, is one one face, one face, one right. one client. Yeah. Yes. Maybe uh, go I ahead. Add a little bit more about the integrator's role. Um, the integrator is not just a, a group of project managers or configuration control people. Of course, that is included. But in, in addition, the integrator they must have experience uh, with this type of facility, uh, uh, this type of nuclear facility, Radway systems, remote handling systems, because they are acting. To be a proper technical integrator, they have to have an understanding of the entire facility, every, in fact, every technical aspect of the facility to ensure integration of the whole facility. So it's not just project management, it's much more than that. So they must have nuclear experience, the integrator, I mean, they must have nuclear experience, some experience with rad waste remote handling and all the general safety requirements of a, of a nuclear facility in France. Thank you. And I, I would just add on a global note that the, the truth is that this whole question of how do you integrate, how does a domestic agency balance its priorities or its procurement aspects with that of the ITER organization is something that is common to ITER. It is built into the, into the way that the, the entire machine and the support systems are all broken down. And so uh, when you really look at how all of this has been coming together over the past five or six years, it's really, and even longer, but particularly as we started uh, more actively the assembly or the construction on the, on the ITER uh, worksite, you're seeing these kinds of questions handled and managed. It's something in which we're uh, becoming increasingly experienced. And it, it's correct what Magnus said. It's much more than project management. It's very much international project management and multi-client uh, project management. A specific question, are you still anticipating a staged approach for the hot cell complex operations? Yes, uh, we do. Uh, th th it is clear that that there we're matching towards the different stages of the tokamak uh, uh, ramp up, 
and we can do that and and we are defining exactly what that means <laughs> because it can mean a lot of different things mm -hmm. uh, staging um, uh, is basically postponing some of the uh, capital cost investment mm -hmm. so 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 this is something that we are currently looking at and we're detailing that because it is uh, intimately tied to uh, of course, our, our budget, uh, mm -hmm. uh, as well as to understand in what order and how we should uh, install uh, specifically building systems and service systems in, mm -hmm. in, in the building itself. Okay. Another yes or no question coming in, which again might require a little bit more explanation, but does the collaborative team need to be entirely located in the Eter Katarash site? So, um, uh, Predominantly, I would say yes, ex at least uh, as, as, as a starting point. Mm. Uh, I mean, we're seeing today with the environment we have that, that teleworking is actually working uh, pretty nice. But uh, one of the strong things that I believe very strongly in is that in order to get a collaboration working, you need to set a certain set of behaviors. Mm. And in order to be able to do that, I do believe that we have to have co-location. Of, of, of a workforce. So it might mean that, for example, the product integrator might be rather heavy on site, uh, uh, but maybe uh, um, other companies within remote handling, for example, that is maybe more suited to do their design work, um, they can do that in their home uh, companies because they, that, that's the environment they need actually to do their <laughs> perform the work. Uh, and then they have delegates actually sitting here to make sure that inter interaction, integration, behaviors, and everything that uh, is, 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 is formed. What we really want to avoid is to build silos. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a collaboration, and therefore we also need a certain amount of, of, of co-location. Okay. I would say uh, with respect to the integrator, for sure the senior members of the integration team need to be on site. Um, and uh, some fraction could potentially be off-site, but uh, we need that critical mass of experienced people uh, on-site that can make decisions on the ground here mm -hmm. uh, without ha necessarily having to refer to their back offices. Good. Um, there's another question that relates a bit to some of the uh, remote support that, uh, that, that might be anticipated coming from Chris Peters. A lot of hot cell and remote handling experience in some of the national fusion labs exists. What, what potential role can they play in the ITER hot cell complex in the sense of advisors and or consortium members? Uh, well, I think I do, I do know that uh, some of the national labs in the member states do uh, partner with industry and are a member of the consortium, so I can see that, that, that working. Um, but there's other ways also as well uh, to uh, participate in the, in the uh, uh, collabor collaboration there will be embedded in it members of the EDER organization, members of uh, FRE, uh, but also uh, members of the EDER organization also include IPAs. Mm -hmm. And IPAs, of course, can come from the, uh, uh, the association labs or the member states labs and mm -hmm. participate through that route as well. Mm -hmm. So th there are several ways to participate um, if you're, if you're coming from one of the member states' laboratories. Okay, good. For those of you who might not know that term, e IPA is ITER Project Associate. And it was something that the council, the ITER council, the governing body, developed as a, an add-on to the, to the ITER staff constraints, what the staff limits are, that ITER project associates uh, could also be added. People who have expertise relevant to a specific, uh, a specific task at ITER, largely sourced from, directly from the, the uh, domestic agencies or a national lab, uh, as, as uh, Spencer just said. So, um, how have the incumbent hot cell complex design supporting organizations performed? Who do you mean by incumbent? Do we I, know, do we know? I don't know. This so was an anonymous question, so I can't even actually give you the background of the, uh, so, of the speaker. Okay, so maybe, uh, maybe I'm not sure how to answer the question, but I can give you maybe some recent history. So, um, we have <laughs> the EDER organization has been designing this hot cell since uh, before the year 2000, so mm -hmm. in the 1990s. And it has evolved, evolved many times, just like the Takamak, in fact, has evolved many times. It's gone up, uh, started very large, got smaller, has then got large, become larger again. Um, in the so eight or so years that I've been involved in the hot cell, uh, we have refined it, optioneered it, uh, redesigned it several times. Um, 
we had uh, different contractors working with us and at the, con at the conceptual level, and they have performed very well for the conceptual, uh, appropriate level for the conceptual design activities. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we have learned a lot. But after now uh, optioneering this facility several times, we know a lot. Um, and it, it's, it's only by optioneering that you can be really sure that you're going forward with a design that really is optimal. And I think we're at that point now. And the, the conceptual design review that we'll have at the end, end of this year will demonstrate that. Okay, good. Um, there are two questions that have come in about risks. And, and actually, in some ways, they're similar to what uh, Christoph Dorschner, who gave the overview of ITER procurement activities, what he was asked a, a bit about risks and liabilities within a multi-party consortium. And the first question, I'll read them both. They're, they're somewhat related. Could you further develop, uh, could you further discuss the risks that each party would assume within the collaboration, within a collaboration? And secondly, similarly, regarding the risk sharing mechanism within a, quote, collaboration, are you contemplating a, quote, pure alliance scheme, i.e. with the specific uh, two partners, the capped risk made specific to partners for tier one, or the type which has recently developed in the UK? I'm not sure what that refers to, but maybe you do. Um, it, it is a bit of a tricky question because we haven't really uh, defined this exactly where where the, the borders between mm -hmm. uh, the client and, and the participants in terms of risk and liability actually lies. Um, there, 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 it's clear that the collaboration um, strategy in itself is a risk mitigation and it should be risk mitigation for both companies but also for the clients. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so um, uh, one of the mitigations that that uh, is included in a collaboration, as such, is actually the 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 the, um, the uh, uh, um, possibility for the different companies and, and and the integrator to actually make decisions themselves and mm -hmm. and divide work as appropriate within the the, the collaboration itself. Mm -hmm. um, so, so um, I I'm. Today, I, I cannot answer where where this this lies because it's really in the procurement strategy, and we haven't agreed with 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 our stakeholders yet about w where we yeah. are on this. We are working with it, of course, but but I can't really answer. And I can also say that it is not a pure alliance type, um, as it's described in in, in NEC four or, or or anything like that. We have to to adjust it to fit. Uh, our project, and, and that is what we're doing with the procurement mm -hmm. strategy, and that is also why it takes a bit of time to actually develop that. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can make a, a general statement. I mean, the whole idea of a collaborative way of working is to reduce um, uh, conflicts between the contractors or with the owner, and so we're trying to set up a structure that will um, I ensure that. Okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, we don't want to be a project which has uh, you know, and invariably, you know, you have a design change or you go a bit late. Typically, this can result in claims from various participants. This is exactly that we, something that we would like to avoid. And we're trying to set up a strategy that will ensure that we, for the most part, avoid such things. Well, thank you. And I, I would say consi that's consistent with what Christoph said earlier in a more general sense, that sometimes those risks are specific to a given project or a particular phase of the project. And we try to make sure that that, act, it's important to us to make sure that that is clarified uh, during the uh, procurement process as people ask for, as various uh, applicants ask for clarification in the process. Um, if the integrator is not involved in the conceptual design, does that mean that COTS components will be imposed and procured by the ITER organization or, or Fusion for Energy as applicable? No, that's not the way I see it. Um, there is an appropriation phase uh, where companies, including the integrator, will come on board and, and, and uh, uh, accept or, or, um, or tweak the design to, to make sure that they can take ownership of the design. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, is, it will follow an, a normal design process with stage gates. With next stage is, is preliminary design, and that stage gate will be done by the collaboration. So uh, I do not uh, think that we, from a, from a conceptual design, will impose certain COTS items. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not the intention. Okay. The, there's the opportunity for the integrator and the other members of the collaboration to look at our conceptual design that we will present to them 
and to make suggestions, modifications, etc., rationalizations. Yeah. Um, and uh, as Magnus said, they, ultimately the collaboration has to take ownership of this conceptual design that has been provided by the IO and uh, FRE. Good. There's a period of time there. I don't know what the duration is, six months or so, maybe yeah, a year, six months. Uh, where there will be this opportunity to uh, critique uh, the conceptual design that we are producing. Thank you both. Um, so it's, it's 11.24. We've got just a few minutes left. We've come to the end of the submitted questions. I'll give a few more minutes as they answer one question from me in case any of you uh, would still like to submit a question. Uh, and if we've done a good job and answered them all, no need to do that. I'm not trying to prod for questions, but um, we have just a few minutes more and then we'll close. A question that uh, either or both of you could answer is, you both had years of experience in this field, decades of experience in, this, in, this overall, in these overall fields of rad waste handling, hot cell complexes, et cetera. Is your expectation, knowing the field, knowing the, the, the international uh, field, that we're going to have a high volume of applicants for, uh, for these uh, uh, hot cell complex and remote maintenance procurements, or would you expect it to largely be, be limited to a small number? So um, I, I would say, first of all, uh, we want many applicants because uh, I think that it's sound with competition. It's sound for us as clients, it's sound also for industry. So, uh, of course, what we are doing right now, we're, for example, we're looking at the allotment uh, uh, strategies and, and how we divide the different uh, um, deliverables within the product to actually attract industry and, and, and companies within industry. So we're trying to match competence with, with allotments. And this is uh, effectively to be able to reach as many companies as, as possible. So, so um, from, from previous experience, um, I think that if you do that allotment and if you, if you are um, uh, wagging your descriptions, mm -hmm. you will not have so many companies actually bidding for, for, uh, for your works. But uh, with a our backgrounds and experience, we're hoping to avoid that. We would like to have a lot of companies coming in and, and, and watch Good. Can I add, um, one thing from our experience, particularly at EDER, is it's very much in our interest, in fact, everybody's interest, that you really understand our project. So mm -hmm. we do plan, once we crystallize all of our, uh, our plans with respect to the strategy, we do plan information meetings and information days uh, to, to really make it clear to the interested uh, companies uh, what we're looking for and so they're best able to understand how to make an offer to us. That will come. Thank you. We have one more question uh, coming in, a specific question about shielding. Uh, will the shielding material already be fixed or will we, will we be able to propose what we think is the most appropriate based on the radio anticipated radioactivity in the, the available space, such as lead or concrete or steel? Yeah, I mean, uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, collaboration will have the opportunity to improve our design. We're making assumptions now, which are fairly simple assumptions, like normal concrete, for example, and steel plate. Uh, but there will be lots of opportunity during the next phases of design um, for the collaboration to make improvements uh, for the general benefit of the overall project and Good. for themselves, in fact. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, one last question, and then uh, I think that will conclude. Um, how should Tier 2s get involved? Yeah, this is actually a, a, a bit of a tricky question, because Tier 2s normally have to uh, collaborate with Tier 1s, and, and we have a hard time uh, um, controlling that, or, or you mm -hmm. know, it's, it's about matchmaking in this case. And, and um, uh, I don't have a good answer to that. It has to be um, sort of the industry uh, collaboration, mm -hmm. uh, industry collaboration to actually uh, achieve this. And and of course, we're also looking at uh, the tier ones that actually already have established links to to other companies. This is something that we would like to know up front as well. Mm -hmm. So so. Um, I, I'm encouraging, of course, industry to, to talk, talk to each other because that is what it is about, to, mm -hmm. to, to, to form these, these group of companies that, that, that can bid. Mm -hmm. And I do, I do realize, I do understand that in order to be able to do that, we need to, to, to proceed on the procurement strategies and the allotments to actually mm -hmm. know what's in, in yeah. each batch for companies to do that. There was a question that came in during Christoph Dorschner's presentation more directly in this saying, can you reveal 
publicly who the competitors are during the during the uh, the competition. And, and no, I mean by rules of public procurement, we cannot do that. But I could add to what Magnus said. Uh, maybe it's a little bit of a catty answer, but how can they get involved? Attending meetings like this one, looking at the participant lists and really seeing who is in there, who is interested, what are these companies' backgrounds, and then reaching out to them and, and you know, speaking about your expertise and, and what you might be able to offer. Um, I'll give one more question. Uh, do you plan to have another info day before summer uh, or maybe an industry event to encourage collaboration at some point? Uh, we haven't planned it, but um, I at least in front of uh, starting the procurement of the product integrator, uh, we, we have to reach out and have a, a, a session uh, mm -hmm. with industry to, to um, r you know, to talk about our plans and, and how, how we're thinking, because at that point we should have a lot more information to, to share. So, so uh, I, I see in front of us something, uh, something will come up, yes. Okay. So I want to thank uh, Magnus and Spencer for their availability today for the presentation that they delivered, as well as all of those who have contributed so far uh, today. It's 11.30, we're going to take a 15 minute break and we will come back to a, a, a set of presentations on the uh, tritium plant. Thank you all very much for your attention. In between, you'll see some, uh, we'll give you a little slideshow of some of the recent uh, lovely photos going on here at ITER in the assembly of the, of the tokamak the preparations for pre-assembly and the, uh, the balance of plant, the support systems throughout. So stay tuned and we'll see you again at 1145. Thank you.
So we're starting up again. Welcome back. I uh, hope you enjoyed the, the slideshow or enjoyed your break of 15 minutes. We're going to get back to a new set of presentations uh, focused on the tritium plant, one delivered uh, more from the ITER organization and the other one by uh, our colleagues at, at uh, Fusion for Energy. And then we'll follow, the, after the two presentations, we'll have another Q&A session uh, with, with uh, the one speaker joining me here in our studio and the other one joining us remotely from Barcelona. So first of all, uh, you're going to hear from Chris Grant Wilson. He is a detritiation system engineer working in the tritium plant section of the engineering design department. Uh, he has a master's degree in mechanical engineering and worked for four years as the deputy project leader of the atmosphere detritiation system project. So please turn your attention to, to Chris and he'll, by pre-recorded video, show you uh, a bit about the tritium plant. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm going to talk about the, uh, the acquisition of the detritiation system. Okay, firstly, I'll give a bit of background as to what this system is. Um, we'll start off here with a picture of the ITER fuel cycle. This is the cycle which is essentially supplying fuel to the uh, the tokamak to the fusion reactor which you can see in the circle on the slide um, it comprises of the the system that's storing the, uh, the the tritium and the deuterium which are the main fuels uh, the systems that that inject the fuels into the torus and then at the bottom you can see um, some of the vacuum systems that extract the tritium from the fusion reactor you can see in the in the circle it's written that about one percent of the fuel is burned. So that means that the, the vast majority of the tritium gas that is put into the torus reactor uh, can be extracted and reused. And that's what the right hand side of this uh, cycle is showing. From the vacuum systems, the, uh, the tritium is recovered through the tokamak exhaust processing, and then the isotope separation system. And that tritium is put back into the storage and delivery system um, to then resupply the, the, uh, the fusion reactor. So this is the, the, the basis of the, the fuel cycle. Now today, the systems that I'm going to talk about are the detritiation systems, which you can see on the, uh, the right-hand side here. The two systems which are shown in red are the detritiation systems. Now they are not directly part of the fuel cycle, but, but they are linked to it. So what I'm going to do today is talk a bit about the, um, the scope of these systems, the functions of these systems, and also the plans that we have for the procurement or the acquisition of these systems. Okay, so on this slide, we'll take a look at the, uh, an overview of the detritiation system, what, what the system is, uh, and, and also we'll look at the functions. So if you look at this diagram, this is basically showing the main subsystems of the detritiation system. Uh, what I forgot to mention on the previous slide is that there's two separate detritiation systems. Let me just go back. You can see here, there's two boxes that are called detritiation system. One is for the tokamak complex detritiation system. So that's in the, the building where the, the, the fusion reactor itself is. And the other one is the hot cell facility detritiation system. So the hot cell facility is um, the, the activated component rad waste facility. So these two buildings have their own separate detritiation systems. The systems are, are separate, uh, but they are, they are very similar in terms of the, um, the, the, the scope and also the, the way they operate. So this slide, going back to this slide then, this arrangement is, this is showing the configuration for the tokamak complex detritiation system. Um, the hot cell facility is not, is not shown, but it's, like, like I said, it's, it's, it's very similar in terms of the arrangement. And if you look at the top, you can see that we've got the, the clients, and then there's actually two separate subsystems listed, what we, which we call DS core, in the middle, so DS core is the the subsystem that is performing the detritiation function itself. Okay, it's the, the process equipment 
um, that, is, that is performing the function of detritiation. So we have DS core, and then on either side of that, you see DS distributed. And this refers to the, the extended piping network that connects DS core to the various clients that you see on the left-hand side. The detritiation system, the Tokamak complex detritiation system has approximately, well, more than 150 clients. And what this means is it needs a very extensive network of piping that goes through the system connecting to the clients. And those clients may be process systems that periodically or continuously vent um, contaminated gas to the detritiation system, or they may be rooms that are permanently ventilated or they may be uh, rooms that aren't normally ventilated, but which would be in the event of a tritium spill. Okay, so, so this picture is showing sort of the, the architecture of the detritiation system. And next, what I want to show oops, are the functions of the detritiation system. Okay, the most important function then is to detritiate gases. So what we mean by this is, if you look at the clients then, the clients on the left hand side, they can send contaminated gases, that's gas contaminated with tritium, which is a radioactive gas, to the detritiation system. And the purpose of the detritiation system, which is in fact one of the most important safety systems at ITER, the purpose of the detritiation system is to remove and collect the tritium from those gases before then allowing those gases to be safely um, released to the environment in a controlled way and that's what you can see on the uh, on the far side uh, with the stack so that's that's the first function the first safety function of the detritiation system it's the actual detritiation function and in the next sl slide I'll show you a little bit about how that's done um, the next important function is pressure depression when the detritiation system is connecting to the various clients, it needs to create pressure depression so that it can suck the air or the atmosphere from those clients um, in order to clean them. So, so if you think of the example of a room that doesn't normally have any tritium in it, it's not normally connected directly to the detritiation system. If there is a tritium spill, for example, the detritiation system will connect, turn on, and um, the pressure depression will, will cause air to be sucked out of that room to be detritiated by the detritiation system and clean air will go into that room and that's the way that room uh, atmosphere is, is cleaned and detritiated. So that's achieved by having pressure depression um, which is done using fans or blowers. And the third safety function is filtration of radioactive particulates. And on the next slide I'm going to show the main components that perform these functions. So we have the same three functions that I just mentioned. Detritiation, filtration and pressure depression. The detritiation function is, perform is, is, is achieved with um, the two components that you can see pointed out there. The, the recombiner which is actually a, a catalytic reactor. So what the recombiner is doing is the, the gases coming in from the clients on the, on the left hand side they will have um, certain quantities of tritium gas in them, together with lots of other gases, hydrocarbons, um, inert gases, oxygen, as is listed. What the recombiner does is um, it oxidizes the tritium and the, the hydrocarbons, uh, converting it into water vapor. Okay, That water vapor is then collected in the scrubber column, which you can see um, which you can see uh, on the right hand side, the scrubber column. So this operates through the process of isotopic exchange. Clean water is fed from the top of the, the scrubber column. The, triti the, the tritiated water vapour is introduced at the bottom of the column and goes up through the column and as it passes the clean water, the process of isotopic exchange um, means that the, the the water that comes out the bottom of the scrubber column is tritiated water. It's, it's essentially collecting the tritiated water vapour from the gas stream that's coming into the scrubber column. And so it, with this technique, 
the gas that leaves the scrubber column at the top of the column is clean and uh, the tritium has been removed. The tritium itself is sent to what's it's shown at the bottom, WDS, that's the water detritiation system. Um, the, the tritiated water is sent to this system where it's further processed. Okay, so that's the detritiation function. The next function is the pressure depression function, and that's achieved with um, uh, fans or, or blowers, as you can see. And then the filtration function is, is achieved with, with filters. Okay, so that's, that's an overview of the main components and how the, the safety functions are achieved. Okay, this next slide gives um, a picture of our 3D model from preliminary design of the tokamak complex detritiation system. And to get an idea of scale, you can see the scrubber columns, uh, the vertical columns. There's eight of those, and they're each 11 meters tall. Okay, and you can see all of the associated piping and equipment. So that gives an idea of the scale of the system. There's eight separate modules. That means that we have, if I go back to this slide, it means that we have eight sets of modules that are doing what we see on the screen here. So eight scrubber columns, eight blowers. And the arrangement is, just going back to this slide, you'll see two trains are called normal DS and two trains are called standby DS. The normal DS is always operating always and the standby DS only operates in accident conditions or if if normal DS stops working for some reason the system switches over to standby DS okay so so in normal in normal operations normal DS is operating standby DS is not operating it's on standby ready to operate if it's needed okay Okay, so what's the status of the project? Um, for the for the Tokamak Complex Detritiation System core, we're at the early stages of final design. So it's been through the preliminary design gate review and now we're in the, the early stages of the final design. The piping network is, um, certain parts of the network have been designed early because we need to install them early because of the construction schedule. So some elements of the, um, the, the pipe network are being installed from this year. This is, uh, the detritiation system is a safety system, it's a nuclear safety system. This means that we need to qualify the technologies to demonstrate that they can, act, they can operate as they need to in all different conditions. Um, we're, at the, we're at the position where we've validated the main technology, so the scrubber column and the catalytic reactors. We are doing some system qualification tests this year in 2021. Okay, I'm going to talk now about um, the planned procurement of the Tokamak complex detritiation system. Um, so, as I mentioned before, we're talking about eight modules, two of which are in normal operation, and six on standby for accident conditions. What we are planning is um, a contract to complete the final design and also procure and fabricate the equipment. So this includes the scrubber columns and it includes the, the blower and the catalytic reactor and all the associated uh, controls and piping. Um, we're planning a contract for the, the procurement and fabrication of all of that equipment and we're going to launch the tender for this this year in 2021. We're expecting that the under this contract the final design should complete in the period from 2022 to 2024 and we're expecting that the manufacturing and testing of first components when we say the first components this means the first catalytic reactor and the first rubber column this will take place in the period 2024 to 2027 with the complete manufacturing completed in 2027. This contract will not include installation of the equipment at the ETA site. It will include just the, the design, the procurement, the fabrication, and the delivery to site to be installed by another contractor. Besides the 
DS Core contract that I just mentioned. We also have plans for contracts for the TCDS piping network. So that's the extensive piping network that I mentioned before that connects to over 150 clients. We have approximately eight kilometers of piping with the associated uh, valves and controls and other line items. Um, so we're expecting a contract for final design and fabrication of that in the period 2023 to 2025. The second bullet point is for component nuclear qualification. So we anticipate that certain components are going to need qualification, maybe valves or um, other, other components like the, the fans or the blowers, for example. So we anticipate having contracts for qualification of certain components. Then the third activity that we're planning is uh, for the hot cell facility detritiation system. So as I mentioned before, this is a similar um, configuration to the Tokamak complex detritiation system. It consists of six modules instead of eight. Otherwise, it's a, it's a similar arrangement to uh, the Tokamak complex detritiation system. And it has a similar extensive piping network. Um, contracts for this we're expecting will follow according to the hot cell facility schedule. And what we're expecting is that the the final design will be in the period around 2026, 2027, um, with manufacturing of the equipment to complete around 2032. And that brings the presentation to the, an end. I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. Thank you very much, uh, Christopher. I, uh, I hope you all enjoyed that presentation. As I mentioned at the introduction, we're going to go now, before the Q&A session, we're going to go now to a presentation from Fusion for Energy from uh, Giovanni Piazza. And um, I'll give you a little bit of introduction to Giovanni as well before that presentation. He's a nuclear engineer, project manager at, at Fusion for Energy, F4E, the European Domestic Agency, for the final design and manufacturing of water detritiation systems and the, the hydrogen isotope separation system. He's got a PhD in nuclear engineering from Karlsruhe University and in fact worked uh, for 12 years at Karlsruhe Institute of Technology as a research scientist on the modeling of the ether plasma and diverter interactions. Uh, as well as a research scientist in charge of the development of ceramic breeder materials and beryllium for the demo fusion reactor, which will come after ITER. He was seconded to the, the Joint European Taurus, the JET uh, Research Center in the UK, as the European Fusion Development, under the, uh, uh, as the European Fusion Development Agreement Responsible Officer. Uh, since 2008, he's been the project manager now at F4E for the in-kind fuel cycle procurements to ITER and as I said, currently in charge of the procurements of the tritium plant systems and the radiological and environmental monitoring systems. I would note um, as we transition to this that uh, you're welcome to submit your questions live during the presentation uh, or after we finish with Giovanni's uh, presentation, we'll try to have Giovanni connected and also to have uh, Chris with us here in the studio and we can uh, try to take a, a Q&A session after that. Thank you. My name is Giovanni Piazza and I am the project manager for F4E procurements in the area of the ITER fuel cycle. In my presentation, I want to give you an overview of F4E procurement scope in the ITER fuel cycle area and in particular focusing on water utilization system, WDS, and the hydrogen isotope separation system, IHSS. At the end, I will also give you a few hints to be considered when preparing your offer. Here we have an overview of the ITER fuel cycle. The boxes uh, in yellow represent uh, the two systems, so the WDS and ISS, that are in a 4 scope. The water utilization system is as an interface, the atmosphere and vent utilization system is receiving the water from the atmosphere uh, vent utilization system and is sending to, the, to it the um, gases like oxygen, nitrogen, or uh, even mixtures of um, hydrogen. 
The other interface is with the isotope separation. We are sending uh, mixtures of uh, hydrogen isotopes to the isotope separation and getting back clean hydrogen deuterium mixtures to be then released. The isotope separation system has an interfa interface with the tokamak exhaust processing system, which is sending the hydrogen isotope mixtures. And, is, and the other interface is with the storage and delivery system, uh, which ISS is sending mixture of hydrogen isotopes. However, we will define percentages. Here you see a uh, drawing of the tritium building and the both water decision system and ISS are, uh, are installed in the basement, in the level B2. So below ground level here, you can see on part of the components belonging to the water decision system, a few, a few uh, tanks. The ISS is on the other side and I will show you in a later slide. Uh, let's start then with the water decision system. WDS objectives are to provide interim storage for, for treated water in water holding tanks and emergency tanks. The second objective is, is to detritiate water and discharge the detritiated hydrogen streams through the stack. So we have storage of detritiated water and detritiation of, of, of water. The water detritiation is achieved by the combined electro electrolysis catalytic exchange method. It means by cracking detritiated water into hydrogen and oxygen in electrolysis, stripping in liquid phase catalytic exchange columns, the residual tritium from the hydrogen stream that is exhausted then through the stack. Then returning tritium to the fuel cycle via the isotope separation system and releasing oxygen via the atmosphere detritiation system. Here you see uh, the layout, uh, current layout of the water detritiation system as developed in the frame of the preliminary design contract by Kraftanlage Heidelberg. So you see the system uh, is made of uh, several tanks. We have the two 100 cubic meters tanks, four 20 cubic meter tanks, then feeding tanks to uh, two times uh, 12 cubic meters, uh, two tanks uh, per uh, seven cubic meters. Then we have the electrolyzers. In the current design, we plan to handle 150 cubic meters of hydrogen per hour. So we will need several electro electrolysis units. Depends how many, depends on the, on the, on the type, on the size of the, uh, of the unit. Then we have the LPC columns, liquid phase catalytic exchange uh, columns. In, in this uh, layout, you can also see the uh, tokamak uh, exhaust processing decay tanks and the isotope separation system. In terms of contract, FRE has already placed contracts for the water deletization system. Actually, we had uh, contracts for the preliminary final design and manufacturing of the emergency tanks, the water holding tanks, and the feeding tanks. Uh, the, these contracts were completed in uh, 2019. Then uh, we placed a contract for the preliminary design of WDS main. So it's the rest of the, of the system besides the, the tanks. This was completed, completed in, in 2016. For, from your side, a four-year multi-lot engineering framework contract tender is underway. It was launched in 2019 with one specific lot dedicated to WDS preliminary design support. This lot focuses on providing support on Tending issues to reduce technical risks on core components such as electrolyzer, hydrogen permeators, catalytic exchange column. Here, few picture of the 
files that were designed and delivered. Here you see the delivery of the 20 cubic meter tanks and the, the installation in the B2 level. And here we have the 100 cubic meter tanks uh, installation. The tanks had to be delivered before the rest of the system because for the installation we needed access to the B2 level from above. Access from once the B2 level is closed was not so was not so easy. So we decided to proceed in this, in this way. Here you see the loading and delivery of the 12 and 7 cubic meter tanks. In both cases, so the, the, the emergency and the titrated water uh, holding tanks and uh, this feeding and high treatment level tanks, the design and manufacturing was performed by uh, ENSA. For what concern the future contracts, so the strategy, the contractual strategy for WDS procurement, we plan to have only one contract for final design, manufacturing, testing, packing, and delivery to ITER. The call for tender for this contract will be in Q2 2023 with the award in the quarter three of 2024. Then the final design will start and the final design review is planned to take place in quarter four 2025. Then we have the manufacturing and the delivery is, is planned in Q3 2030. Which are the competencies that are required to suppliers? Of course, we have chemical engineering, uh, focusing in, on distillation technologies, production, handling, operation of packing catalyst, permeators, electrolyzers. Then mechanical engineering competencies are also required because we have manufacturing of medium large size components and glow boxes. And of course, handling of detected uh, gases is also a requirement. It's important in the design phase. If we now look at the ISS, the isotope separation system, the objectives of this system are recycling of tritium and deuterium from inter tokamak exhaust and the support of WDS operation by the initiation of a hydrogen stream for, this, for discharge. So, recycling of tritium deuterium and support to WDS cleaning the, the uh, hydrogen streams that uh, uh, water deletion is sending to ISS. It's achieved by cryogenic distillation to separate the hydrogen isotopes from the mixtures supplied by other uh, systems. And then by delivering the products at the required hydrogen isotope quality, that means uh, isotope percentages, to the storage and delivery system and to the water dedication system. In the tritium plant, you see the isotope separation system is distributed over, over several uh, levels. And if we look to the system uh, in itself, we have an, a, a, helium, a helium cooling system which is uh, dedicated to ISS. So uh, this is done in order to avoid that uh, in, in contamination of the helium is then spread all over the plant. So uh, any contamination will remain inside the ISS. Uh, system. This is very important. Then we have expansion tanks. These tanks are used to, uh, to collect or to store hydrogen in case of uh, increase of temperature in, in the cryodistillation system so that the hydrogen is vaporized and then we need the volume. To, to collect and to store this uh, hydrogen in order to avoid the risk of its uh, explosion. Then we have the cold box. The cold box is where the cryo distillation takes place. We have several columns in the inside with packing and the um, hydrogen isotope mixture, in, uh, liquid 
phase is, uh, is uh, uh, separated out. We have a vacuum system in, in order to ensure the thermal insulation of the thermal insulation columns from the outer and from the outside. Then we have glow boxes, valve boxes, and the the INC, so the instrumentation and control system that is also part of our of our uh, procurement. In terms of contracts. Fusion for Energy has not placed con uh, contracts uh, till now. We have uh, only ITER that placed contracts for the conceptual design. Conceptual design was completed with, uh, with a conceptual design review in uh, 2019. Again, the frame of the same four year multi lot engineering framework contract, that, uh, whose tender is uh, underway. There is one lot dedicated to the uh, isotope separation system, preliminary design support. This will focus on providing support on outstanding specific component technical issues to reduce technical risks on core components, such as cryo heat exchanger and cryo isolation columns. Fusion for Energy will uh, start uh, placing contracts in uh, 2023, we are talking about one contract for final design, manufacturing, testing, packing, and delivery. The call for tender is uh, planned for the uh, quarter to 2023 with award in uh, Q3 2024. The final design review will be in Q4 2025. The manufacturing delivery is planned in quarter two 2029. In terms of competences that are required, two supplies are very similar to the ones we have for the water utilization system. So we need chemical engineering competences, distillation technologies. In, in this case, we are talking of cryo distillation. So we are working um, at 20 Kelvin. And okay, expertise in packing and cool, helium refrigeration, helium cooling. For the mechanical engineering, we have manufacturing of medium large size components and glow boxes as for the uh, WDS. And of course, in here we, have, uh, we require handling of glitiated gases expertise. Say that few information on the contracts and how to prepare the offer, what to take to account when preparing the offers. So the intention is to uh, use the competitive with negotiation procedures. This means that we will have an invitation to tender published on the EU official journal and a FORE website. After receiving the, the, the offers, there will be first evaluation in order to select the three tenders admitted to the following negotiation stage. Then we have these three tenders the negotiation, and the, they will then submit after negotiation a final offer for evaluation and selection of the supply to be awarded the contract. The time from the invitation to tender to the contract signature is usually around 12-15 months. Please consider that f is an EU agency and follows financial regulations of public institution. This means there will be limited flexibility in comparison with what may be usual in private enterprises. Limited flexibility in the handling of this and in the management of this contract. When preparing the offer, please take into account that ITER is a nuclear installation and it is a first of its type facility. So there are very stringent safety and quality requirements that will require a significant effort, time spent in documentation preparation and review, development of design, manufacturing and testing, following well-determined uh, uh, procedures that have been previously reviewed and accepted by Fusion for Energy and uh, IO and, uh, personnel 
in performing protection important activity shall be qualified. And this means also to provide evidence of this qualification, making training trainings for this uh, for qualifying personnel. And then also there will be audits carried out by ECORIT, but also ITER and potentially also by the French authorities. So all of this is, uh, means an effort to be considered when preparing the offers. And this closes my presentation. For any question, you can contact Fusion for Energy Market Intelligence Group, in particular, Medi Daval. Here you see his uh, mail, email address and his telephone number. Many thanks. Thank you very much, Giovanni. And um, I, we're going to go now to a Q&A session, which is a bit different than the ones you've seen before. As I hope you can all see on your screen, Chris is able to join me here in the studio. And we've got Giovanni joining us live from, uh, from Barcelona. Uh, Giovanni, can you just say hello to make sure we've got a good connection here? Hello, good morning, everybody. OK, great. Perfect. OK. So we've had a few questions that have come in. And you're welcome to, on the, on the uh, event webpage, you're welcome to continue to submit questions over about the next 25 minutes. We, uh, we have until about 12.45 France time to, uh, to continue. So first question, uh, which components of these systems that the two of you have been discussing may require shielding against magnetic fields, like solenoid valves, sensors, et cetera? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's, that's a good question. Maybe I'll start first for the, um, the detritiation okay. system, Giovanni. Um, for the detritiation system, um, DS core is located in the tritium building, and because of this, it's quite far away from the magnetic fields that you have from the with the, the fusion reactor. So, whilst there may be some qualification that needs to be done for some very sensitive components, generally speaking, this is not a significant um, aspect of the technical requirements. On the other hand, though, there is um, the 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 detritiation system piping network does run also in the, 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 the Tokamak building as well. And there's piping in what we call the port cells and in the, um, the gallery in the tritium building that would be exposed to much higher magnetic fields. And I think that it probably would be solenoid valves and other instrumentation that, yes, will need some qualification against magnetic fields. Okay. Giovanni, would you like yes. to add? From my side, okay, my reply is very similar. Uh, for, uh, to what uh, is said and in any case so we will have to check need for qualification so in the design we will see whether the magnetic field is uh, is too high or it is acceptable for what, uh, what we have in the, in the market and then decide if qualification is needed or not Till now, so we have done the preliminary design, I would say there is no need for special qualification. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, we have a couple of questions that have to do with uh, existing contracts or uh, and in terms of whether they've been awarded and what you can tell about that. So first one to, to uh, Giovanni, who was awarded with the conceptual design of HISS? The conceptual design was performed by uh, ITER. So for me, because it was in ITER scope still, and they have done partially uh, internally and partially with contract to other companies. But uh, okay, this may be Chris may know better the more details. Anything Actually, to add, Chris? Yeah, no, 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 nothing, nothing really to add. To that. Okay. Um, Essay sonorization. Ne pas prendre en compte. We pause for a moment. We test tests. Do not take into account.
Okay, we apologize for that interruption. We had a test of our public address system uh, here at ITER. We go through those kinds of announcements periodically. So next question is similar about a particular system for the, uh, for the, for the DS, the detritiation system captive piping installation. We see that it begins in 2021. Has the contract been awarded already? If yes, can you say to whom? Uh, yes, it, it has been awarded. Um, this is because uh, some of the piping in the detritiation system uh, piping network is installed in locations where if we don't install it now, other systems will be installed and we won't have access to install it later. That means that we're installing um, some pipe work under the, the TCC zero contract, which is happening at the moment. And I think details of that contract are available on the procurement ETA website and it's with um, NG. With NG, okay. Thank you. Um, Sorry again for that pause, this time an emergency siren, again just a test, sorry for that. Um, continuing, could you tell us a little bit more, uh, expand on your discussion about the skills and industrial competencies required for the Tokamak Complex Detritiation System Core Contract? Well, okay, I mean, it's, a, it's essentially a, a process plant. Fin des essais sonorisation. End of public address tests. Fin des essais sonorisation. End of public address tests. Okay. Oh, okay, so, so as I was saying, it's, it's essentially... Um, Alert is over. Alert pipi terminé. Alert is over. Alert pipi terminé. Okay, yeah, so, so it's essentially a process system. And the, the, the main competencies that are required then, it's, it's chemical engineering. For it says sonorization. Okay, so the detritiation system, DS Core, is it's a, it's, a, it's a process plant. And so there's the detritiation function, but the, let's say, the, the design and the sizing and... Fin des essais sonorisation. End of public address tests. Fin des essais sonorisation. End of public address tests. Yeah, so the... Um, the, the, the main competencies that are required, it's, it's the process engineering for sizing and specifying and designing the equipment. So it's heat exchangers, um, catalytic reactor, scrubber column, as well as the piping and the connecting valves, um, as well as the, the instrumentation and control side of things. And one of the important aspects of the detritiation system is that it's a safety function. So it needs to have safety class rated instrumentation and control. Um, as well as that, you, you have the, the mechanical engineering aspects as well. So the, the design of the vessels and the, the pipe work, the pipe supports, the, uh, the skid frames. So it's, it's kind of mostly conventional process equipment um, that are the main competencies needed for this. Okay. Thank you. And, and thank you once again for staying with us through those interruptions. Um, for the ADS, what is the, the breakdown between IO and JADA, the Japanese Domestic Agency? Oh, okay. I mean, the entire project is run by a joint team. So it's different to other projects at ITER where some portion of a project scope may be supplied by a domestic agency 
Um, in this case, the entire project scope is delivered together by the joint team. And this joint team is um, it's a team that's comprised of ETA st IO staff and also JADA staff. So there's no split in terms of the equipment scope between Japan and IO. It's all delivered together as a joint team. Okay, thank you. Uh, for the TCDS piping network, the eight kilometers of installation which we see for 2023 to 2025, can you tell us what will be the grades required and whether it's welded or seamless? Uh, okay, it will all be uh, seamless, seamless pipe. It will all be um, welded because it's because it's carrying tritium. Um, the the approach is to weld as much as possible to have to have as few uh, leak points as possible. Uh, generally, it's going to be 304L um, stainless steel. Okay, thank you. Um, how will the future TCDS core contract, the final design aspects, interface? with the current fuel cycle framework contracts being tendered by the ETA organization? I don't think there is a significant link between the two. I think they're separate and I think the framework uh, contract that has been mentioned is more for other tritium plant subsystems and not for TCDS. Okay, thank you. What are the hard shell leak tight enclosures for vulnerable process equipment? Is that one for you, Giovanni? Pardon? Pardon? Is that one for you, Giovanni? Let me read it again. What are the hard shell leak tight enclosures for vulnerable process equipment? The leak tight, we have the ISS. You can see the, the uh, cone box there. And the, there, I take it again. So we have the steel cone box and uh, then the expansion tanks. This is for the ISS. For the water utilization system, the containment of the electrolyzer is uh, quite important, is, a, is a to be manufactured, because usually in the, what we find in the market, the electrolyzer in the market, they are not built, they are not engineered to work with uh, tritium. So we will have um, to spend some, uh, some work, part of the design work, in, the, in making the electrolyzer tritium compatible. For the rest, I think we will go, we have already, is not in special, we have steel con uh, container. Thank you, Giovanni. Um, Another question talking about uh, glove boxes. So they, uh, the, the writer says you focused on tritium equipment. Could you give us more details about the glove boxes? Um, information about whether you will need glove boxes, what some of the requirements will be, and anything about the associated tender? Okay, the, the tenders for the glove boxes for both ISS and the water utilization system will follow the the plan I have the schedule I have indicated uh, in my in my presentation because we want to place one contract mm -hmm. for one integrator and this integrator will take care on them uh, getting the single uh, the single components the glow boxes of course we want to have so uh, um, uh, lift tight glow boxes because they have will have a lot of um, hydrogen inside the inventory of hydrogen, the tritium, but also hydrogen is important. The tritium inventory will be very high, and in particular for the isotope separation system, there the glow boxes will have to be will have to deal with huge quantities of um, of hydrogen and and tritium. So the detailed the uh, characteristics of these toy, uh, glow boxes will have to define at least for the uh, ISS and as soon as the design proceeds, the uh, editor still we have not started making work on the isotope separation system. So. Okay, thank you. Uh, Chris, based on your comments around the detritiation system being essentially a process plant, are you confident of the required expertise being readily available from the market? 
or are there specific specialists, uh, specialties or, or aspects that you foresee being difficult to procure? Um, I, I, I don't think so. I think that we have, uh, for some specialist technologies, um, it may be that there are reduced numbers of suppliers that can supply. I think we've, I we've identified that the technology is, is available on the market. Um, no, so I don't, I don't see that as a particular problem. Okay, thank you. Do you envisage, envisage the TCDS design and manufacture contract being more likely awarded to a manufacturer or a design organization? Given the procurement rules that are about uh, ITER's procurement rules for only 30% uh, being subcontracted, uh, is it likely that only manufacturers will, will tender as leads? Uh, I don't think we have a strong view on that at this point. I think we'll just um, we'll be launching the tender later this year, and we'll we'll see um, what uh, what the best offers are that come in. Okay, thanks very much. Um, I would say that in relation to that thirty percent subcontracting uh, aspect, that is an ITER organization rule. Christoph Dorschner was asked to explain that a little bit earlier in the overall procurement overview. And he made it clear that, that um, this is when, uh, if you are forming a consortium, in other words, if you're coming in with, a, with multiple companies coming in as a single entity to apply, that 30% rule does not apply to the members of the consortium. It applies to any subcontracting that goes beyond that. So if you form a single consortium, just, just from the point of clarification. So in this case, um, in addition to what Chris also said, it could be both. It could be a, a, a team that included both the manufacturer and the design organization coming in as a, as a consortium. Um, as we stand, we have uh, a few more minutes left, and this, this is the end of the questions I've had submitted by the audience. Um, I'm going to ask one more question of Giovanni, similar to something that, uh, that Chris was asked earlier, and also a question that was put to our experts on the hot cell complex earlier. And it relates to... Um, what are your expectations? You, you've been in this industry and in this in, in these areas of specialty for quite a long time. What are your expectations for the procurements that Fusion for Energy is coming up? Do you expect a lot of applicants, uh, very few, very specialized applicants? And, and maybe you, if you want to break that down for different aspects, that, that's okay too. Okay, for the, for the water irrigation system, where we have, uh, uh, let's say, more and more uh, common, technologies, I may expect uh, say not many applicants would be we welcome uh, uh, applicants, <laughs> but uh, I do not expect very many, but okay, a certain number, uh, I would say beyond, uh, beyond uh, three, four, five, five applicants. Different is the uh, contract for the isotope separation system there. Okay, the, we, we need the uh, applicants with knowledge in cryodistillation. So in cryodistillation, so it means working with, um, with the helium. There may be a little bit more uh, complicated. However, we will see the, we will see how it evolves during the, the design. Once uh, uh, ITER has uh, performed the preliminary design for the ISS, we will know what is the market. Of course, we will also carry out in the future for energy market survey to inform European companies of uh, what is about and uh, when. So the information uh, I have given to, uh, today is part of the information we usually uh, provide during the market survey that uh, is coming before a, a contract. But so I am confident that uh, there are companies in Europe for both systems, a little bit less, the market is less broad for the ISS, however, we will see, we will try to get on board as many as possible tenders. Thank you very much, uh, Giovanni. That, uh, I think, brings us to the end of the overall questions. I would just mention one more particular aspect, which is uh, something that was asked in a number of presentations earlier this morning, um, which is, can, can ITER share who the competitors are? In other words, during the uh, 
competitive process, can we share so that if people want to sign on or to form additional groups or whatever, is that possible? And the answer is no. Under, under public pro procurement rules, we can't do that. However, um, it's a very good reason, uh, just to put a, a twist on, on today's meeting and tomorrow's, it's a very good reason to attend events like this because look at the participants list. If you have a particular skill or expertise or, or, or uh, in your company that you would like to provide, that is, you're, you're hoping to join a consortium, you're hoping to contribute in some particular way. That's always a possibility. And look at the companies that are the participants here uh, to this meeting, and you're, you're welcome to talk among each other, to ask each other, et cetera. But we rely on industry to develop any of those collaborative efforts uh, pre-competition on their own. And, uh, and, and we can't, of, co uh, of course, share the, the details of the competition during uh, while it's going on. One final question is a logistics one, which comes in periodically, which is whether the uh, meeting today will be recorded. Can we access it later? Can you get specific access to the presentations like those that Chris and Giovanni just delivered? The answer is yes. Uh, we will be putting all of this out uh, on YouTube later. So if you want to just search for the recording, you can just search remote Eater business meeting at, uh, on YouTube. If you want to come to the Eater events page or just go to www.eater.org and again, do a search for a remote Eater business meeting. It will bring you to our events page. And after tomorrow's uh, conclusion of all of our presentations, we will have there the, um, the uh, presentations for download so that if there are links in there that you'd like to click or, or you just want to review in more detail some of what your presenters have seen, that will be available. Finally, uh, we're coming now to a break. Um, I want to thank you all for your, for your uh, attention and participation this morning uh, for the active Q&A. Uh, I specifically would like to thank Giovanni and Chris for your presentation on the tritium plant. And um, we will start up again. We'll take a lunch break now. We will start up again at 1400, 2 p.m. France time. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.
Good afternoon and welcome to all of you coming back to, uh, to rejoin us here at the Remote Eater Business Meeting. Uh, my name is Laban Koblenz. I'm the head of communication. For those of you who are not in the morning session, we heard uh, some general overviews of Eater procurement as well as specific presentations on the, uh, the tritium plant and the hot cell complex. The next presentation that we're going to be going to this afternoon is from uh, one of our domestic agencies, Fusion for Energy. For those of you not familiar with how the ITER project works, there is a central organization and seven domestic agencies representing each of the seven ITER partners. In the case of Europe, uh, as the host member, it is the largest uh, of the domestic agencies because it is responsible for, for in-kind procurement uh, contribution for about 45% of the member contributions, whereas the others are each 9% each. So this afternoon we're going to have uh, a presentation. Uh, you're going to meet in a few minutes uh, Leonardo uh, Biagioni. Um, he is the Deputy Chief Financial Officer at Fusion for Energy, the European Domestic Agency, and in charge of commercial management for ITER site construction activities. He holds a PhD in Plasma Engineering and a Master of Science in Aeronautical Engineering. He joined F4E from the space sector in 2009, uh, quite early in the project, and since then has been in charge of procurement, contract management, and commercial activities. He will be joined during his presentation by Victor Saez Lopez Barantes, the head of market analysis and intellectual property services at Fusion for Energy. Uh, he, uh, Victor owns a, uh, a master of science degree in law. He joined ITER right at the start, uh, sorry, joined Fusion for Energy right at the start in 2008, and since then has been in charge of market analysis, business intelligence, intellectual property, technology transfer, and export control. At the conclusion of the presentation, you will see, you will have the opportunity for a question and answer session uh, with Leonardo. He will join us uh, live from uh, Barcelona. So in the uh, on the website, on the event site, you can see a place where you can enter questions uh, during the presentation if you want to, or after the presentation when the Q&A has begun. So we will come back to you after that. For now, please turn your attention to Leonardo and then Victor. Thank you. Good afternoon to all the people listening, attending to this uh, event uh, online. My name is Leonardo Biagioni, and together with uh, my colleague, Victor Saez, uh, I'm going to uh, introduce uh, the business opportunities and the way in which you can do business with Fusion for Energy in the context of fusion activities. Fusion for Energy is uh, the European Union Agency for the Development of Fusion Energy. At this moment in time, this means mostly uh, it's the European Union Agency for ITER. It's a public organization operating since 2008 with headquarters in Barcelona and offices in several locations around Europe. A staff of 460, more than 460 people and the budget uh, which was uh, recently renewed for the, uh, the next or the present uh, multi-year financial framework of the Union, uh, which is uh, in the order of uh, now around 600, 750 uh, million euro per year. The, the development of fusion in Europe uh, is built around two pillars. One pillar, which is the research, essentially the research uh, uh, community and the research activities, uh, which uh, is coordinated uh, by Eurofusion. Uh, with it's, uh, Eurofusion is an entity operating in the context of uh, the research and innovation programs of the Union under the Directorate General for Research and Innovation. And then uh, a more industrial part, which is uh, in charge of building, actually building uh, uh, the infrastructure, the machines which are serving uh, the development of fusion energy. This is embodied by Fusion for Energy. Uh, which is uh, an entity uh, coordinated by the Directorate General Energy under the in the European Commission. Fusion for Energy is the domestic agency for the ITER project. Therefore, is the direct counterpart to the ITER project for what concerns the European in-kind contribution. 
the European uh, uh, the European roadmap for realizing fusion energy goes through several steps. It started uh, more than 30 years ago with the construction of the joint European Taurus jet, which as you probably know uh, is uh, a, a large tokamak, um, no, no superconducting tokamak, uh, which is operating uh, in uh, the United Kingdom. It's uh, continuing at the moment uh, with the participation to the ITER project. Uh, you received uh, earlier today uh, more information about the project and how it's organized, so we're not going to repeat much of this here. And uh, in the longer term, we'll continue with the next step, which is uh, at the moment uh, labeled demo, uh, which is uh, uh, going to be the prototype energy uh, electricity generation generating uh, machine. Uh, these are the main uh, elements of the fusion roadmap uh, defined by Europe, but these are definitely not the only ones. There are a number of other uh, installations, uh, facilities which uh, have been built or are being built uh, supporting these projects uh, and which are uh, in, in many cases foresee the uh, involvement of industry for building components, infrastructure and so forth. Um, JT60SA is uh, a project which is uh, ongoing in Japan. It's a collaboration, a joint uh, activity between Europe and Japan with, under a, a, an agreement which is called the Broader Approach. Uh, and uh, a, a, another important facility uh, which is going to be built in the next decade, uh, still under the Broader Approach Agreement, is the IFMIF, IFMIF Dones for which the candidate European site, as you will see in a few minutes, is in Spain. Uh, the neutral beam test facility in Italy, MBTF, is a facility which is supporting directly the ITER project. Uh, you will see there are many, still many activities. The construction was in large part completed, but there are still many activities ongoing in relation to the neutral beam test facility and more in general the neutral beam injectors for ITER. Uh, the Diverter Test Tokamak is uh, another facility which is being built in Italy, which shares many uh, technologies and, and, uh, and features with uh, ITER, although on a smaller scale. And last but not least, uh, W7X, which is uh, a stellarator operating at the moment, uh, at the moment operating in Germany, which is supporting the alternative uh, ways uh, to exploit uh, fusion processes to generate energy. Clearly, uh, at this moment in time, the, the cornerstone of this strategy, of this roadmap is ITER. And the four in what will follow will mostly refer, or for 99%, refer to ITER and the activities uh, regarding the European contribution to the ITER project. The governance of the ITER project uh, uh, in Europe, as we said, uh, goes through uh, Fusion for Energy as a domestic agency and uh, through the European Commission uh, as the party to the ITER agreement. Uh, in fact, uh, the, the party to the, the, to the ITER agreement is Euratom, which is represented by the European Commission. Uh, and our governance as, a, as an agency is, uh, of course, uh, relatively complicated as almost anything which uh, exists under the, the, the framework of the European Union, because we have then multiple uh, stakeholders on the EU side. We report to the Council and the Parliament. The Parliament is our, our ultimate uh, budgetary authority. Uh, but we also have uh, the, the individual member states participating to our governance. As uh, I briefly anticipated, uh, uh, we have uh, our headquarters as an agency in Barcelona, in Spain. Clearly, we have a very important operational site in Calarash on the ITER site. Uh, as uh, most of you know, we are uh, responsible for the most of the, of, the, of the buildings, of the civil works for, for the ITER site and therefore uh, it is required to have a very significant presence on site. We have uh, uh, a smaller site in uh, Munich, 
which uh, deals with the broader approach and with the preparation for, for demo. We have a very small presence in Japan in the context of the broader approach agreement. And then we have uh, uh, a small presence in uh, Padova in Italy on the neutral beam test facility site. And as I mentioned, in the future, we expect to have as well a small presence in Granada in southern Spain if uh, uh, Granada is eventually selected as the site for the donors construction. Over the past 10 years or 12 years since uh, established, uh, uh, Furon for Energy has awarded uh, about 5.5 billion euros in contracts to industry. This is not uh, the 100% the, the of the European industrial participation to the ITER project because European industry has also been very successful, as, as you know very well, is very successful in bidding for um, calls for tender published uh, directly by the ITER organization and uh, uh, also successful in uh, uh, getting uh, in winning uh, opportunities from the other domestic agencies participating to the ITER project. However, uh, in spite of this, it's clear that uh, the vast majority of industrial engagement for what concerns ITER uh, is represented uh, by the FRE calls for tender. And in this respect, when we look at uh, 2021 and 2022, uh, we can already anticipate that uh, this engagement for European industry will continue uh, at a very significant level and uh, in the next uh, two years, two years and a half, uh, around 2 billion euro in market value in calls in value for new contracts will be accessible to European companies. About 1.5 billion from uh, Fusion for Energy and the rest uh, from uh, uh, ITRIO and uh, other domestic agencies were applicable. Uh, as being a European Union agency, when we engage with industry, we have to comply with the European Union financial rules. Uh, we operate uh, under the EU general financial regulation, which is essentially the same type of regulation based on the public procurement directive. So it's essentially the same type of rules uh, which are used for any public procurement in EU member states. We can uh, procure um, with, uh, with due exceptions, but uh, in the, the basic rule, the general rule is that we can procure uh, from companies established in one of the EU member states plus the associated countries. And here, as I mentioned, the associated countries, I think it's important to open a small parenthesis. As you know, uh, the United Kingdom and Switzerland, uh, for different reasons, uh, uh, ceased being associated countries on the 31st of December 2020, and they're now in the process of reassociating again to Euratom for the purpose of fusion research activities. Now, this means that at this moment in time, uh, our geographical scope is only for is only in EU member states, so it's not including the UK nor Switzerland. But what is foreseen is that in a relatively short time frame, uh, both the UK and Switzerland will again be uh, associated members to Euratom, and therefore will again be fully eligible. It's a bit difficult uh, to predict when this will happen in terms of precise timing. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we have put in place uh, a number of uh, uh, interim measures to make sure that uh, there is a certain degree of continuity for companies established uh, in the United Kingdom and, uh, and uh, Switzerland, and that, that there is not now a complete stop. Uh, the ILOs, uh, the Industrial Liaison Officer for the UK and Switzerland, have more information regarding these interim measures. Therefore, I suggest if you have any questions in this respect, I suggest that you address these directly to the ILOs. Uh, we are maintaining close contact and provide for continuous information to, to them. So having said uh, this, so the, our geographical scope uh, is uh, the EU member states. Uh, um, we uh, publish on the official journal all uh, opportunities or calls, all calls for tender with a value exceeding 140, 144,000 uh, euros. 
uh, the four. Uh, any significant contract uh, will appear on the official journal first, uh, and then through the official journal, you will also be able to uh, have to, to have access uh, to our uh, to, to all the documentation through our industry portal, as will be explained by Victor in a few minutes. Uh, the type of contract which we can uh, uh, which we sign usually with industry or research organization uh, is uh, um, the same, which is uh, uh, usually which which is the same which is done by all the public public entities in Europe. So we have commercial procurement. We can award grants for research activities. Uh, we can uh, award uh, innovation partnerships, framework partnerships, and or more in general, we can uh, seek expertise from individuals. The same for what concerns public, uh, for what concerns procurement procedures, uh, we can have uh, uh, calls for tender, which are uh, following uh, the usual schemes uh, in the public procurement directive, the four open calls for tenders, restricted calls for tender, negotiated competitive dialogues, and so forth. For what concerns uh, the uh, activities which are performed on or near the ITER site in France, uh, we have a collaboration agreement with the uh, Agence ITER France to provide uh, uh, support to companies willing to, to locate staff or facilities near the site and uh, I think most of you are familiar with uh, the Welcome Around uh, ITER partnership, for which you will also find the link on the web page, on, on, the, on the slide. Now, for, for the next 10 years, uh, just trying to summarize briefly uh, which are going to be the main elements uh, for our up, up, upcoming competitions, I think we can uh, uh, there are no, no big news. We are focusing uh, at the moment on the completion of the in-kind contribution for the ITER first plasma. But at the same time, we are accelerating uh, the procurement activities in relation to the, to the following stages in the ITER project. Therefore, we are as well starting, uh, we have already started several significant procurement procedures for the uh, pre-fusion power phase one of ITER um, and uh, to a lesser extent also for the pre-fusion power two and the deuterium tritium activities. In parallel, we just signed uh, with Japan uh, the extension of the broader approach agreement. So the, the broader approach agreement has now entered the phase two and uh, during uh, the first half of the 2020s, uh, there will be a significant uh, volume of uh, business opportunities also in relation to the broader approach uh, to the contribution, to the continuing contribution to the JT60 machine in Japan, but more importantly, of course, uh, about the possible construction of Donis in uh, Spain. Coming back to ITER, uh, the, the 2020s, in the, during the 2020s, uh, civil works on the site will remain a very significant part of the European in-kind contribution. It's not uh, going to be uh, as dominant, as a, a portion as dominant as it uh, was uh, uh, in the previous decade, between 2010 and 2020. Uh, during this time frame, about 75% of uh, our procurement value went uh, on uh, on civil works in uh, in Kadarash. it's going to be less than this, but still by far the the most uh, the most uh, important uh, activity we we have uh, at least for the first half of the 2020s. In addition, there are several other mechanical electromechanical elements for the tokamak for the ether tokamak, which are being procured, and uh, in a few minutes, Victor will go through the. Uh, most important uh, opportunities now in the short uh, medium term. Uh, one particular um, element which we think is, is important to highlight is the fact that we are moving uh, with our NCAN contribution uh, in the direction of uh, more complex integrated systems. We think usually when we use this expression, we think about the di diagnostics and the heating systems. 
which means that uh, uh, there's going to be an increasing role in our supply chain for system integrators, which, which means uh, companies having not only the control of certain technological, uh, uh, let's say, technological processes or, or, or capabilities, but uh, companies able to integrate uh, and coordinate the activities of several actors uh, in order to deliver a, a highly complex, fully functioning and fully integrated system. Now, before handing over the floor to Victor, uh, I want to show you a short video which summarizes a little bit uh, the, the steps and the processes uh, for submitting uh, a tender to FRE. You also find this video on YouTube, so if the quality of uh, the sound during the streaming is not very good, just go and search for it on YouTube and you will find it again. So here comes the video. F4E is responsible for Europe's contribution to ETA. Its contribution will be delivered through contracts signed with industry and SMEs to manufacture the components needed. Contracts are awarded through calls for tender. You can find all calls for tender at F4E's industry portal, as well as the EU's official journal. Applicants must satisfy a series of requirements. First, your company needs to be established in the EU or Switzerland. Next, ensure you have the minimum technical and professional capacity to provide the requested service. A consortium of companies can submit a joint tender, and subcontracting is also allowed to cover the full scope of a contract. Also, your company must comply with the minimum turnover specified and other financial conditions. Then, check to make sure you have an appropriate quality management system. Lastly, if your company is breaching the law or in bankruptcy, your tender won't be accepted. There are two main procedures to submit your tender. For an open procedure, read the technical and management specifications and prepare your tender. For a restricted procedure, submit your expression of interest first. If your company is selected, then prepare your tender. Tenders must be sent by the submission deadline to F4E. Tenders are evaluated in two ways. The best value for money criterion takes into account the technical quality of the offer as well as its price. The lowest price criterion awards the contract to the cheapest offer that is technically compliant. Start reviewing calls for tender today and help Europe contribute to the biggest energy project. Good. Uh, I will now pass the floor to Victor, who will uh, introduce uh, you to the upcoming business opportunities from Fusion for Energy. Thank you for your attention to so far, and please, Victor, control is back to you. Thank you, Leonardo. I will focus now on the forthcoming business opportunities within the next few months. First of all, let's take a look at the schedule for the first plasma systems. For obvious reasons, most of the first plasma activities were contracted long ago, and the first components are being delivered and assembled at the ITER site. This does not mean, however, that the business opportunities are over. First, because there are a few possibilities yet linked with first plasma components, which have not been yet published. And second, because we are in parallel preparing the delivery of the non per plasma components. As you can see on the, on, this, on the schedule in the slide, there are many components whose contractual activities will begin in 21, 20 and 22. I would like to bring your attention in particular to the diagnostics line at the bottom of the chart. This slide refers to the diagnostic. Again, I would like to emphasize the fact that in this field, there will be many new uh, contractual activity going on within the next few years. So let's move now to the work program for 2021. The budget foreseen for FRE for contractual activities is around 1 billion euros. It is important to note 
that not all of this money is devoted to new call for tenders. As you can see in the yellow, uh, in the highlighted part of the table on the right, about 18 service contracts and 35 supply contracts are the ones that will be expected to be contracted through call for tenders. The remainder are specific contracts allocated within the context of an existing framework one. In the following slides, I will refer to the main procurement activities linked with this uh, highlighted, uh, highlighted budget. Let's begin with magnets. Well, maybe th there are some project teams where I will not uh, refer to many procurement activities because the project teams are current, currently dealing with going contracts. This is the case, for instance, uh, for magnets, where no significant procurement opportunities are expected to come during 2021. There may be amendments or options for existing contracts and also some task orders related to quality inspection services or production support might be signed. However, these activities are linked with existing ongoing framework contracts and will not result in new contractual opportunities in new call for tenders. The same goes for vacuum vessel. So we don't expect to have in this field anything else than maybe some uh, options, amendments and task orders related to existing contracts. The manufacturing of the five vacuum vessel sectors uh, uh, that uh, Fusion for Energy that Europe is responsible for will continue and will intensify during 2021. The first three sectors should be completed this year and will enter into the assembly phase. Then we move into in vessel, the diverter. Here we have some activities going on. The main activity foreseen for this for the diverter during this year will be the launch of the call for tender for the series fabrication of the inner vertical target. This call for tender is however addressed to those manufacturers whose one-to-one -one prototypes were already qualified. We have also in the pipeline for this year, the preparation of the documentation for the signature with ITER IO of the procurement arrangement for the diverter rates. This should result in call for tenders being published in 2022. Then finally, there is one activity that may be more of interest for you now, which is the imminent publication of OP1112. The subject matter of this call for tender is the engineering manufacturing process, testing and series production of around 4,700 pins, sleeves and links, as you can see in the slide, made of steel 660 or aluminum bronze. These, these elements are required to attach the plasma facing components to the cassette body. This call for tender will be focusing in companies with precision mechanics capabilities. In Invesel, again, but uh, regarding uh, linking with the, with the blanket, we have another call for tender similar to the one for pins, leaves and links, which is, called, which is referring to the production of the so-called standard parts, which will be used in the assembly of the ITER first wall panels. This one as well should be published within the next few weeks. Then remote handling is another area where the main contractual activity will be linked with the release of task orders and options through remote handling and engineering unit framework contracts. It is worth recalling anyhow that in 2022, 2022 sorry, the framework contract for engineering support and remote handling is coming to an end and that an important call for tender will be published. Then we have on cryo plant and fuel cycle, uh, well, we don't have many call for tenders publishing this, uh, this year since our colleagues will, uh, will be occupied with implementation of existing contracts. Uh, 
the same goes for antennas and plasma engineering. We have here a couple of core for tenders on the screen that have been closed very recently. The first one, the 1120, is a considerable, a, a significant one for the design, manufacture, assembly, testing, and delivery of the electron cyclotron upper launcher, plug, and ex vessel web guide systems, which is being now under consideration. It's being analyzed and it's being uh, evaluate, evaluated. There is also the OP1142, the, pro the provision of support services in the area of nuclear safety, which was closed yesterday. Any other uh, contractual activities in this field will be implemented through existing framework contracts. Then we move into neutral beam and electron cyclotron power supplies and sources. Here there will be some important activity. First, FRE will procure six gyrotrons for the ITER project in a joint procurement activity with ENEA, the Italian agency, who also needs some gyrotrons for the DTT project in Frascati. The purpose of this joint procurement is twofold. On one hand, it helps creating the sufficient critical mass in the market to make this, uh, this call worth considering. On the other, it should facilitate the coordination of the two projects, DTT and ITER, to make sure that our needs are addressed on time. Then we also have, you, you may be more interested maybe to know about a couple of call for tenders to be signed in the second half of this year once the procurement arrangement for the neutral beam vacuum vessel is signed with ITER. I am referring to the, uh, to the design, manufacturing and testing of the two neutral beam vessels with an option to include uh, a third one. And also uh, for, the, uh, for the second call for tender that relating to the tools necessary for the support, transport, lift and installation of these vessels. There are uh, these uh, 45 different tools that need to be procured. These two call for tenders should be published in the second half of 2021. Then, if we move to diagnostics, here you have on the screen a couple of call for tenders which have been recently closed. I will focus then on the on the last one on the OMF 1126 for the manufacture of first plasma systems, which is being published these days. This is a particularly interesting business opportunity with a budget going beyond 20 million euros and with many different components from optical, mechanical, cables, uh, areas. So having regard the heterogeneous nature of this contract, we expect receiving bids from integrators that will need the support of subcontractors and suppliers to cover the full scope of the contract. This is a, a good opportunity for new companies that may not have dealt with our activities in the past. So I would like to invite you to check in our industry portal the information that was published after the info day, which was organized on the 26th of February. Let's move now to the TBM, text blanket module, modules. Sorry. Well, once again, this is a field where the contractual activity will be focused in the signature of task orders for the continuation of ongoing activities. The test blanket modules uh, colleagues are now under the uh, are now evaluating OMF 1091 and 1070. On site buildings and power supplies, this is the work program for this year, which is quite important, and we have some significant call for tenders. I'm referring first for the to the support to, to the owner for the hot cell complex, the OMF 1137. This is being published in the official journal these days. And the scope of this contract is the support of the site buildings and power supplies project team during its day-to-day -day activities. It covers the technical supervision, monitoring and management during the different stages of the construction and this contract will replace the existing one that we had with the consortium Energia, which is coming to an end this year. 
Then, uh, well, as regards the hot cell complex, I don't think that I can add anything to the information that you got from the presentation this morning. Maybe I could just add or draw your attention to the market survey that we have published a couple of weeks ago on multi-cut services for the hot cell team and that you can uh, uh, view in the, in the industry portal. Finally, we have two important contracts, TV21 and TV22. TV21 is a quite a big contract with uh, going beyond 150 million euros, well beyond 150 million euros. There are two lots. Lot one is for electrical instrumentation and control, fire detection, earthing and lightning works. And then there is a lot number two for mechanical works, for heating, ventilation, air conditioning. This is an important contract. TV22 is also important, but it is not as big as TV21, and both have been, are being published these days. Actually, on TV22, we have uh, an info day some days before the Easter break, and I would like to invite you to check in our industry portal once again all the information that was shared with the people, with the companies attending this meeting, that uh, I, I believe that this can be of interest for you. Then uh, let's move to broader approach. On broader approach, you have, well, we have three business opportunities ready to be launched. The first one is OP1102 for the centrifuge which is one of the components of the pellet launching system of GT60. The scope of the contract covers the detailed design, manufacturing, assembly, delivery, and testing of the component. And it's going to be published on the second half of 2021. Then we have OP1149. The contract relates to the manufacture of 12 full-scale mockups of the diverter plasma facing components for testing. The plasma facing components of the GT60 diverter are made of graphite, not of tungsten, as it is the case of the ITER-1. And we are expecting some interesting competition in this area. We also have OP1133 for the engineering support on site for GT60. So the scope of this contract is the provision of basic engineering services, such as repairs, assembly or maintenance in Naka and Rokasho. So they need to be fluent, fluent in Japanese and have Japanese certification for carrying out the work. It speaks in favor of a call for tender open worldwide. Then the last, I think, yes, this is the last, last slide about the, the, the call for tenders, the open call for tenders, or the call for tenders to be published in the next uh, few months. It is on supporting activities. We have a deadline on the 28th of April for uh, supporting tools for project management. We are talking about IT tools, Oracle, Primavera, SAP, and Ecosys. And then uh, in, in the second or third quarter, you will have the uh, uh, OMF 1110, which is for the procurement of support for carrying up for carrying out safety analysis in compliance with the French nuclear regulations. Then finally, we have the OMF 1159 on engineering support, which is actually the renewal of the framework contract that, the, uh, that will be split most likely in two lots, one for general engineering and the other one for civil engineering. So this is what uh, was about the forthcoming business opportunities. But I would like to emphasize that all the information that I have just mentioned, it is updated weekly, well, daily in our industry portal. If you want to be updated with the latest information about forthcoming business opportunities, I will uh, advise you to register in this industry portal if you have not done so and check often because this is where we are advertising everything. So there will be a refurbishment of the industry portal during 2021, maybe a new look possibly, uh, who knows, maybe new features. So, well, uh, keep tuned. I will also like to draw your attention to a practice that we are having to get your support, to get your feedback 
on the results on how we are dealing with our procurement activities. So whenever a company is bidding to one of our contracts, uh, together with the, with the notification letter, we are sending a notice that you can see on the screen where we are inviting you to provide us with your feedback about the process in which you have taken part. So your input is taken into, into consideration for the continuous improvement of the way in which we perform procurement at FOE. So I will like to invite you to make use of this tool, which is very useful for both for you and for us to learn from our mistakes. Finally, I would like to close my, my, uh, uh, my intervention with a reference to the technology transfer uh, activities that we are carrying out. On the screen, you have a screenshot of, the, of our website. We have published after the summer last year, a website on technology transfer that you have here, the, uh, the link where we are advertising the technology transfer activities that we are carrying out with a number of brokers that are working for FOE. The idea of this program is to foster the use of technologies coming out of the fusion field in non-fusion field. This is one of the reasons why, for instance, we publish, we have this uh, uh, award that was closing on the 18th of March, uh, uh, some few days ago, for the use of technologies in fields uh, different to fusion. So we are now evaluating the proposals and we will be notifying in the following weeks who is the, the winner. This award will be followed uh, by the end of the year with a technology demonstrator, which will have more, more money on it, so hopefully around 30K, to help some companies develop some technologies beyond the scope of fusion uh, again. So I would like to call and to well to emphasize that this is a very important activity for us and we would like to invite you to come to the uh, technology transfer program website and visit and be active. So thank you for listening to the presentation and I think that now we will move to the questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Victor, and also uh, Leonardo. Uh, so yes, we come now to a question and answer session. Some of you may have been joining us in the previous ones. Uh, some of you, this may be new. Uh, we've seen that during the presentation, we've had some questions being submitted online. You're welcome to submit questions now in addition. And uh, we have about 20 minutes, and we're very fortunate to be joined uh, directly live from Barcelona by uh, Leonardo. Uh, so we, uh, Leonardo, maybe you want to say just hello or something so we make sure our microphone levels are working back and forth. Yeah, thank you, Leban. Okay. Uh, can you hear me well? I can hear you very well, thank you. So the, uh, the first question is, is one that has to do with uh, joint developments with, with Japan. Are there F4E programs to incentivize joint developments with the Japanese domestic agency by European contractors? I'm not sure I understand uh, co correctly the scope of the question, but uh, if uh, it is about the joint uh, research activities or joint development activities, the answer is, is no. Uh, we procure items in Europe uh, to fulfill our obligations in the context of the broader approach agreement, which means we buy items which, which are then most of the time sent to Japan, uh, but there is no explicit collaboration foreseen uh, in this context. Uh, I think Victor uh, presented uh, one call for tender in which, for instance, we are procuring mm -hmm. services in Japan. Again, uh, uh, it's not a collaboration activity with uh, the, the Japanese uh, domestic agency. We're just uh, uh, providing certain services in Japan, but it's a, an exclusively FRE contract. Okay. Thank you. Um, Another question about a, uh, a recent partner who's not a partner, who's becoming a partner, so about Brexit. Um, could you clarify the latest situation regarding the EU-UK cooperation following Brexit, specifically regarding uh, membership in Euratom and the uh, cooperation with UK Atomic Energy Agency on the MAST-U project? 
Uh, the situation for what concerns uh, the reassociation of the UK and in, to a similar extent of Switzerland uh, uh, is, I think, what uh, anybody can, can read in the press in the sense that uh, uh, there is a, in, in a, there was a political agreement which was reached uh, at the end of 2020. This political agreement has to be now ratified in a, in a new ac uh, association agreement between the UK and Euratom, uh, for which a draft uh, text has been agreed, but the, the agreement itself has not been ratified yet and uh, will presumably not be ratified until the summer. This means that un until ratification, the UK is uh, effectively not an associated uh, country, uh, not an associated country to Euratom, uh, and therefore uh, UK companies are not directly eligible to participate in our calls for tender. I mean, th this does not mean that uh, uh, they are completely excluded because we do have under specific conditions and on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis, we have the possibility of opening uh, our calls for tender also for uh, companies established outside of the EU. Uh, the one important aspect uh, which has to be pointed out is that we need to, um, say, we, we, we need to evaluate the, this possibility before the call for tender is published. And this is the reason why it is essential that British or Swiss companies who are interested in one of the upcoming opportunities and you can still, even if you are established in the UK or Switzerland or elsewhere in the world, you can still register in the, in the industry portal, have a look at what is coming up and, and uh, which are the market surveys and, and so forth. So if you detect something of interest, it's essential that you inform us directly of your interest or even better that you inform uh, the industrial liaison officer for Switzerland or for the UK, uh, because then when we get this information, we can take the necessary step before publication of the call mm -hmm. for if, I mean, deciding and if in case of positive decision, opening uh, the competition outside of the EU. But this needs to happen uh, with a, a significant advance, I would say at least one month yeah. uh, before the date for publication. Yeah. Thank you. I think that in that question, you've, you've uh, anticipated and answered uh, two other questions, or one other question at least. I'm going to combine two uh, that uh, you, could, you might go into a little more specifics on one aspect. The first question was, does EU associated countries list include Ukraine? The second one is, can an organization, and you've started to answer this, that is not registered in the EU or Switzerland be a consortium member to specifically a tier one company? Okay, so regarding Ukraine, the answer is no. Ukraine is not a Euratom associated uh, country, uh, therefore cannot uh, directly participate. Uh, but of course can participate as a subcontractor. And uh, clearly uh, this is also true for companies established in the UK or Switzerland. In, in this case, however, well, also in the case of Ukraine, of course, but in particular for Switzerland uh, and, the, and the United Kingdom, uh, if a call for tender is, um, say, is open for participation outside of the EU member states. And if this opening includes the UK and Switzerland, because uh, there can also be a selective opening, uh, then companies can uh, participate as uh, tier one partners in a consortium. So to summarize, participation as subcontractors is always possible. Participation of a company not established in a EU member state as a tier one contractor, so even directly or as a consortium member, mm -hmm. is only possible for those calls for tenders which are um, which are which are selected are um, decided to be opened outside of the EU. Good. <clears throat> Thank you. That's very clear. Um, the next one is topical, more about the diagnostics in particular. Uh, the question comes in: What future business for system integrators can be expected? in the area of diagnostics. What are the core competencies for system integrators and what role does nuclear safety competence play here? So a three-part question there. If I, I think in terms of which are the upcoming opportunities, there was one slide in Victor's presentation and uh, I understand that the presentation will also be made available to all the participants. You, you can go back and check it. 
so there is one slide listing all uh, the systems, the diagnostic systems, or the, the heating systems. In, uh, these are the two main areas, or remote handling as, as well in a longer time frame, in which system integrators um, will uh, will have a role. So I think the answer was the, the the answer to this question was already in the presentation regarding nuclear safety. Uh, yes, nuclear safety is an important concern. Uh, ITER is a nuclear installation. Uh, I'm sure it has already been discussed at length uh, during the morning. It's clear that there are some systems which have which include uh, uh, components which are important for nuclear safety aspects. And for these, we we have a very um, very precise requirements to be fulfilled uh, by anyone bidding. What is important to remember is that when you uh, bid for a system including a nuclear component, of course, if you do not have the nuclear capability in-house or the nuclear heritage in-house, you can uh, partner up with other companies having such uh, nuclear expertise or a, a, a nuclear safety system which is compliant with the requirements. Important. In case you partner up with someone uh, to cover the nuclear safety aspects, remember that the entity performing the activity, which is relevant for the nuclear for nuclear safety, must be the one having uh, an appropriate, a, a compliant nuclear safety system. So it's not sufficient to say I team up with another company, but then I, without sufficient heritage or sufficient system, I then perform activities which are. Um, which are safety relevant. Mm -hmm. It's not. It's a non-transferable quality of a consortium. In other cases, there are some transferable uh, quality, transferable, let's say, uh, skills which are considered for the consortium as a whole, and therefore it's sufficient if one member of the consortium has it. But it's not the case when it calls when we go back to nuclear safety. In this case, whoever performs the task which is safety relevant must have the appropriate safety qualification. Thank you. This is, uh, this is very, very uh, consistent with uh, an answer that was given on a, on a different topic earlier in the area of nuclear safety, so thank you. Um, in order to be able to prepare, th this question again may have been answered already both in your presentation and, and Victor's, but you may want to expand on it. In order to be able to prepare a relevant consortium or partnership, how can we anticipate the upcoming F4E tenders in a case where there is not a market survey prior to the bid? Uh, well, the industry portal contains um, a, large, uh, a large extent of this information, but uh, I would say that uh, your first point of contact to uh, address this need would, would be your national in, uh, industrial liaison officer, ILO. Mm -hmm. uh, we share, we are all continuously in contact with ILOs. You can find a list for all the, the ILOs appointed by different member states on our webpage. One caveat, not all member states have uh, appointed an ILO yet. So if you do not find the ILO from your country, uh, then get in contact with us directly and we will, uh, we will inform uh, uh, the, gov the, the national government of the fact that there is a need for an ILO. Uh, but having said this, the majority of uh, FRE member states have appointed an ILO. You have their contact information on our uh, web page, and they are the uh, first point of contact for this need. We share continuously information with them, uh, so they are um, informed in advance when there are uh, upcoming opportunities, even before this gets published on the industry portal. So that's the best way for you to, to get early information. And then the industry portal, of course, Good, thank you. Um, the next question I might uh, answer a bit myself and then, and then uh, Leonardo, you might want to expand. Uh, it's about the on-site vacuum vessel activities. What is the estimated start date for on-site vacuum vessel assembly activities at Catarash? Uh, you may find it quite interesting to stay tuned because this week actually we had the actual, uh, after some, some, some lifting, we had the actual, just uh, in the last 24 hours, the actual placement of the very first vacuum vessel sector, sector six coming from Korea, put it onto the subsector assembly tools. And uh, I'm not sure the questioner whether you, whether you know, but that, this then begins pre-assembly activities in which two toroidal field coils coming either from Japan or from Europe, uh, manufactured in Italy, 
uh, will be placed in, as well as actually before that, the two sections of the vacuum vessel, of the associated vacuum vessel thermal shield. So that's, those operations have actually begun. Uh, I don't know, Leonardo, if you want to expand on that answer at all. No, I think you, you have. Uh, in, in fact, uh, I read the, the question on the chat and I thought, well, this is for Laban to answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. And, uh, and, and we will be publishing uh, photo, photos and also for those of you who get the ITER bulletin, you'll get a little advanced because you'll see some photos tomorrow. For those of you who are uh, getting things through our public website, we will certainly have uh, an article about this um, on Monday next week. Two questions um, coming in related from, from two different people about uh, OMF uh, 1126. Um, the first question, one is, when is OMF 1126 expected to be open? The second one, how far is OMF 1126 a good opportunity for new companies? Since electrical feed-throughs are nuclear safety critical, it makes it difficult for newcomers to cover the full framework that have not yet gotten much heritage in this field. Can you comment? So regarding the publication date, uh, that's uh, very straightforward. I think uh, we are really just a matter of days. Uh, everything is ready, just uh, about uh, the last few clicks, and it will be published. Uh, regarding the second question, uh, is this a good opportunity for newcomers because of the nuclear safety aspect? Uh, I think this, to a certain extent, is connected to what I, I mentioned earlier. Uh, if you do not have uh, the, the, nuclear safe, the nuclear heritage which is required, you can partner with someone else, uh, in particular for nuclear feed throughs, uh, sorry, for electrical feed throughs. Um, however, be careful. If you partner with uh, uh, a company uh, to address the nuclear safety requirement for the feed throughs, then this company must be the one actually manufacturing mm -hmm. uh, the electrical uh, the electrical feed hose. It, it's, it's not possible to have a setup in which you partner with a company, but then the manufacturing is done by someone else. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, we now come to the, uh, to the end of the, the questions that have been submitted online. Uh, we still have a couple of minutes. I'll make just a couple of logistical comments in case there's a last minute question. Uh, I, I would like, uh, we also had questions coming in, this happens almost every presentation, uh, where people are asking, is it possible to view either this presentation or a previous presentation, uh, will it be possible to go back? And yes, we're, we're broadcasting on YouTube, we're also broadcasting on the event page, which if you're on YouTube, you can find by going to the remote ITER business meeting, just searching for that on our ITER organization website, www.ITER.org and you should be able to go back to earlier parts of the presentation. There's a specific one about, uh, quote, the webinar from yesterday, April 6th, on remote handling and accurate motion control. Actually, that was today, just a little bit earlier. So yes, you should be able to go back and view it, but also uh, tomorrow, uh, when we finish all of the two days of this remote ETER business meeting, we will put on that event page uh, the videos and the presentations. In, in case, for example, there's a particular diagram you want to view or there's a link you want to click from a presentation, all of those will be uploaded tomorrow afternoon for, uh, for anybody who did not have a chance to witness it live or did witness and wants a little bit more information. So thank you very much, Leonardo, and uh, uh, also uh, thanks to, Leben, to Victor for his role in the presentation. We're Leben, one, yes, one, please. one comment. I, I, I'm not sure about, uh, I mean, the last question may also refer to a webinar which was broadcasted by FRE in the last few days. Okay. So if, if the question is about the FRE, I mean, if it is about the... The webinar in, in, uh, in this event, uh, Laban already answered. If it is about the webinar broadcasted by FRE, uh, then uh, it will be put online. All our webinars are then put online, and it will be online on the Technology Transfer Marketplace webpage, for which you, you received the, the link earlier uh, the, by Victor. It will be put in a couple of days. Good, thank you. That's clear. And I think I should also mention when you go to the ITER procurement page, which was listed in, in uh, the overview presentation by Christoph Dorschner earlier, you have links actually to Fusion for Energy's procurement page and to the procurement pages of all of each one of our domestic agencies. And there are occasions where you have procurements, even though the, the most of the procurements for a given country 
or in the case of the European Union as that member, most of those procurements are sourced internally. Some of those procurements do have opportunities for others. And uh, Leonardo gave some clarification, but that can also happen if you go to the Korean or the US or, or some other domestic agency uh, page. And uh, on the comments, Leonardo has, uh, has put where you can go for that, so thank you. We will now go to a break. Uh, if you're online, you will see us going to a slideshow of lovely Eater uh, photographs from recent operations. And we will resume at 15.15, uh, 3.15 p.m. France time. Thank you, Leonardo. Thank you. Goodbye.
Welcome back to all of you. We have uh, one more presentation today. This is a little bit different uh, from the other presentations, which were about specific procurement opportunities. This is more of a presentation focused on how you, if you are working with ETA, particularly if you have a local presence here in the region, um, an asset, a service that is available for, uh, for companies. So we're going to hear from David Laurent um, from Welcome Around Eater. And, and uh, David Laurent works for uh, Rising Sud. It's an economic development agency of the, of the regional authority, Région Sud, uh, in Provence uh, Alpes Côte d'Azur. Rising Sud is a member of this Welcome Around Eater network, which gives, I think, David some uh, real qualifications to talk about it. And he's going to go into some, some more detail. I won't say a whole lot about it, except to say that the, the Welcome Around Eater network uh, including many partners like the ETER organization, is coordinated by Agence ETER France. So please stay tuned for our final presentation for, uh, uh, about Welcome Around ETER by David Laurent. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, before starting, I would like to thank ETER organization uh, to give us the opportunity to participate at the remote ETER business meeting uh, in order to introduce who we are with the Welcome Around ETER network and what kind of services we can provide for you. The presentation will be in three sections. First section, a presentation of the Welcome Around ETER and its services. Second section, a quick overview of your great region, the South and West region. And last section, we're going to have two testimonies from two companies which have been supported by the Welcome Around ETER. So let's start who we are with the Welcome Around ETER network. The Welcome Around ETER is a strong regional network with one goal, welcoming and supporting companies having ETER contracts which have to operate on the ETER construction site. The Welcome Around ETER network includes many partners. Agence ETER France, the coordinator of the Welcome Around ETER network, the Industrial Committee ETER, the French Lésion Officer, Région Sud, the Regional Authority, and its Economic Development Agency, Rising Sud. The French Government, Pôle Emploi, the French Job Center, um, the, French, uh, the French Chamber of Commerce and Industry, and it's a great value for, for, for us to have in the Welcome Around ITER, ITER organization, making the contact with ITER supplier easier. The Welcome Around ITER provides many services for ITER suppliers in five main areas. Immigration, accommodation, industrial support, business setup, and human resources. It's a free, confidential, and personalized assistance. So we're going to see more detail about all of these services. First service is immigration. ETER supplier can have information about the obligation with regards to French social and tax regulation, entry and work formalities, but also there is a unique entry point for residence formalities dedicated for ETER. Accommodation and transportation solution. ETER suppliers for their employees can have information, listing, uh, listing of accommodation near ETER seat, uh, assistance for housing, information for transport solution, and also the employee can be linked to relocation operator. One important information, there is an international school from nursery to high school in Manosque, near ITER, for ITER employees, and sometimes for ITER suppliers. Industrial support. The Welcome Around ITER can help you to find industrial partners, but also subcontractors and especially local subcontractors. We know more than 300 French industrial involved in the energy and fusion sector. 
There is also the ITER Business Forum, the main professional event around ITER. You can already save the date. The next ITER Business Forum will take place in Marseille in April 2022. Business Setup. If an ITER supplier needs to find office premises, the Welcome Around ITER network works closely with seven local development agencies. Invest in the Alpes de Provence, Les Hautes Alpes, Team Côte d'Azur, Provence Promotion, la CCI du Var, Vaucluse Provence Attractivité et Euro Méditerranée. All together, we can also arrange meetings for you with key regional economic actors. And last uh, area of services, human resources. There is a dedicated, dedicated team uh, to support ITER suppliers during the recruitment process for identify tal available talent, disseminate job offer, and training courses to help you for uh, local recruitment. One more thing. There is an important public support to increase the number of welder trained locally. So if you want more detail about the Welcome Around ITER, do not hesitate to contact us by email. So let's move to the second part. So before the two testimony, I would like to have with you a, short, a quick overview of the economy of the South of France region. Région Sud Provence Alpes Côte d'Azur, um, to show you all the opportunities you can have for your, for your business in our region. So let's start. South of France region has an ideal location in a gateway, in, in a gateway to Europe, Africa and Middle East, an economic zone that is home to more than eight hundred million people. We have four universities, including the largest French university in the world, Ex Marseille University. And it's also a, uh, uh, it's also a region with a good work-life balance, as you can see from mountain to sea, with, mal with many marinas and winter sport, sport resorts. Transport and logistics. South of France region, as uh, the port of Marseille Fosse, the first French port and the second Mediterranean port. We also have port of Toulon, the first military port in Europe, and four inter international airports. It's a region well connected to the world. So now let's, let's, do, a sh let's do a short focus on ITER with the ITER road. The ITER road is a road of 105 kilometers uh, to deliver ITER components from Fossabour to ITER site. You, you can see a lot of pictures from the delivery if you check sometimes the communication from ITER organization. Next slide. I'm going to give you a few key figures. So in our region, there is 5 million residents. Three major metro areas, Marseille, Toulon, and Nice, and more than 2,200 international companies are located in the South of France region. And as you can see on the map, it's a very important region for, for data. So now talents, important, sub, important uh, subject for your development. As I, can say earlier, as I can say earlier, we have the first largest French university, uh, which is, uh, which is uh, Ex Marseille University. And we are the, um, and we are, and we have, we are the second region in France for research and development investment with more than almost 14,000 researchers. And as you can see on the presentation, we are one of the leading destinations for young talent in France. So we have also a strong industrial economy. 
with uh, more than 420,000 direct and indirect employment for the industrial sector and 59% south of France region export sales are made by the industrial sector. Uh, we have uh, six um, in strong uh, industrial sector, as you can see on the map, energy environment with ITER, for example, aeronautics and naval, manufacturing, electronics, um, chemical, microelectronics, and food industry. I want to do now a focus on research and development ecosystem related to energy and ITER. Very important for big science. So we have the CA, the French Alternative Energy and Atomic Energy Commission, which is a key player, uh, which is a, which is a key player in research development and innovation in low carbon energy. Uh, there is uh, the Fusion Institute, with 20 PhD students graduate per year, and many key international partners. And uh, we have Cap Energy. Cap Energy is a network of energy stakeholders that seeks to develop synergy between academia, academia and industry. It's about 550 members. So it's a great opportunity uh, for the south of France region to host ITER on its territory. And as you can see, it, uh, put, uh, it puts uh, our region at the top level in the world for a, fu a future fusion industry. So as you can see, we have many companies involved in the project. French companies like Framatome, CNIM, um, Onet, uh, CST, T uh, Techno Plus Industry. We have also international companies like uh, Jacobs, an American company, Vitro C7, Italian company, Ensa, Spanish company, Kepco, South from South Korea, Sicon, German, German, German company. And I cannot end my presentation without talking about the quality of life of the South of France region. It's three global winnowed uh, territories, Provence, Alps, and Côte d'Azur, the French Riviera. And last but not least, it's 300 days of sunshine per year. So it wants to bring the sun to the earth. So I can say with 300 days such of sunshine per year, the most is almost already here in our region. Thank you for your attention. And now we're going to have two testimonies from two companies which have been supported by the Wicomor Auditor. We're going to start with Mr. Tai Jiang, Deputy Director from CNPE. And then, following, Mr. Gregor Vakovics, Operation Manager from Meta. Thank you, Mr. Chan, to be here with you today uh, for, for a testimony. So, you're Deputy Director from CNPE, and I've got some questions for you. Okay, thank you. Are you, are you uh, how are you involved in ITER with CNPE? Yeah, uh, we paid uh, uh, attention uh, to ITER project. Uh, a long time ago, uh, uh, in uh, 2018, uh, when uh, ITER uh, called for tender all around the world, uh, we first uh, organized a team, it's a great team, uh, CNT consortium, uh, to uh, prepare the tender uh, works. Uh, in our team, in CNP consortium, uh, there are five companies. The first one is CNPE. CNPE is the e EPC company in China uh, uh, nuclear industry. The second one is a CNI, 23rd company. This company is good at uh, installation uh, activities in the nuclear field. Uh, the third one is uh, uh, Famatum. Uh, it's uh, uh, a local company. You know this uh, company uh, very well. And this company is uh, gave the consortium a great support. And the rest of two companies uh, is uh, uh, institute 
from China focusing on uh, fusion technology. Uh, these two companies gave the technical support for the consortium uh, of CNPE. Okay. At what time of the contracting process did CNPE get in touch with the Volcom Arronditer and how did you find us? Yeah. Uh, 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 we first uh, uh, meet the welcome around the ether on um, two uh, years ago, uh, March of 2019, uh, during the IBF organized by, by ether organization. In fact, uh, uh, we were uh, surprised uh, that there is such association that can help the ether contractor. Uh, as a foreign uh, contractor, when we were preparing for the setup of the Type 1 project, uh, uh, we faced uh, many difficulties. Uh, for example, the labor re regulations, uh, the human uh, uh, mobilizations, and uh, 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 welcome around ether gave us uh, many support. It's very good uh, support, so thank you very much. Yeah. You're welcome. Yeah. Uh, when you arrived in France with your teams, uh, which support did you get from the Welcome Arronditer? Was it easy to find accommodation? Yeah. Uh, in July uh, 2019, my colleagues received a warm uh, welcome from Welcome Around uh, Eater. Uh, furthermore, we received uh, an introduction about the mobilization, accommodation, uh, human resource, and uh, regulations in detail. Uh, this uh, information helped us a lot uh, uh, during our setup stage. Could you tell us a few examples of how the Welcome Auditor helped CNP? Yes. Uh, I would like to uh, express my, sp uh, my uh, uh, special thanks to welcome around the eater. Uh, we have uh, uh, faced numerous difficulties in scanning uh, Chinese employee uh, to eater site. Uh, uh, welcome around the eater uh, always uh, gave the best support to our work. Permit to our work permit here, uh, the, the, the visa application, residence application, something like that. Uh, this uh, information helped us a lot uh, uh, during uh, uh, the first stage of our company here. So, uh, David, uh, you also have provided us support for the driving license. And so uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh and 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 this this matters. So thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, are you looking for local industrial partners? Uh, yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Uh, uh, we are uh, looking for support from the local supplier, uh, especially uh, for the custom machining, uh, special tool manufacturer. Uh, and the local labor resources, including the, the workers, uh, welders, and the lifting operators, and the paintings, uh, something like that, uh, as well as the, 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 the engineers. Yes. Uh, uh, it is our good willing to set up uh, the strong uh, relationship with the local companies, uh, which were not only benefit to each project, uh, but also benefit to the local eco economy. Yeah. Uh, right now, uh, right now uh, we have uh, uh, each uh, contract with a lot of local company. Uh, this company provide the, uh, the, 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 the strong support to our consortium. Uh, such as uh, CityLag, uh, ODF, uh, MUF, TPI, and so on. Many uh, uh, several uh, uh, contractors of our consulting. So it's, uh, it's, very, it's very good. 
uh, local company. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the last question. Yeah. You live in the south of French region now. Could you share with us what do you like in Provence? Uh, yeah. Uh, no, uh, I lived in Manosk and okay. work in Cadillac. Yeah, uh, uh, I think uh, uh, it's always uh, sunshine uh, here. I very like the weather here. And uh, the, the, the people uh, in here is uh, very kind, very friendly, and the work is uh, <laughs> their work uh, effectively. Yes, I, I'm very uh, uh, happy to be here. And also, I'm looking forward to enjoy the lavender in the coming months. Uh, thank you. It's beautiful. Yeah, yeah, it's very beautiful, yes. So thank you very much for your testimonies. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Thank David. you. Thank you, Gregor Rakovitz, to be here with you today. Thank you. So we're going to do a testimony. Meta will be in charge of an important work on ITER site to execute the installation of the cooling system, vacuum vessel pressure suppression, some vacuum paperwork, and equipment to generate tritium. Could you tell us more about it? Well, David, uh, yes, indeed. So we, we have a five year contract starting now, and uh, it will be a challenging project. Um, we have a quite extensive uh, uh, number of activities to do on this project to cover the scope of work you've just described. So just to give you an, uh, an idea, we have around 1,000 tons of piping to install, uh, which repre represent around 30,000 wells. Uh, we have 600 tons of supports, 600 tons of structures. Uh, regarding E and I, we have a lot of activities. Also, we have uh, we have 70 kilometers of cables to pull, and we have 700 um, uh, instruments to install. And uh, regarding the equipment, we also have a, a quite extensive uh, amount of work. So, uh, just to give you an idea, also we have around 250 uh, equipments to install, and the biggest ones uh, are up to 100 ton uh, for for one uh, for one tank. Uh, which represent uh, a, a quite challenging uh, activity uh, inside this uh, tr tricky and small uh, environment. So uh, to, to support that, we will need to have some uh, partners and we will have some partners all around Europe uh, and also locally to, uh, to make uh, this uh, uh, on site for ITER. Thank you. Your first team has just arrived on ITER site. How can you be helped by the Welcome Our Editor Network and its services? Um, so, f first of all, we have to settle. And uh, uh, we have some installation inside uh, either site, but we also need to have some installation outside. And uh, Welcome Our Editor is uh, helping us today uh, to find some places to, to settle uh, out outside uh, either site, so a storage area, for example. Uh, and um, we also need some. Uh, subcontractors, some partners uh, to support this installation. So uh, we will have some relations, uh, thanks to you guys, um, uh, for the installation of our activities. And um, we, we will need also, uh, as we are a European company, uh, we have some expatriates coming for this project. So we will need the support uh, of a Welcome Renator to uh, accommodate uh, our people. So. Uh, we need your support also to, uh, to, to find some uh, accommodation for them. So this is a, a good start, but we are also thinking in the future, in the coming months, uh, maybe to have uh, organized uh, a business uh, meeting uh, to uh, meet uh, maybe some potential other partners to improve our performance, to improve our uh, presence on site. Uh, and uh, I think this will be something interesting uh, in, a, in the near future. So. You will plan recruitment campaign at a local level. We talked about recently and you had a meeting with a dedicated team from the French Job Center for ITER. What are your expectations from the Welcome Around ITER in human resources? B basically, uh, as we are uh, new uh, in, in, this, uh, in this region, uh, we will need your support to, to get in touch with the right person and the right people for uh, the um, uh, local uh, uh, manpower providers. We, ha we, ne we need also to, to have your support uh, for the French, French Job Centre uh, uh, contacts to, uh, to, to, uh, to develop uh, some uh, uh, maybe partnership uh, 
and uh, to, to, to source uh, our people uh, for, for the project. Okay, great. Uh, so you were talking about local partnership with local subcontractors or training center, for example, with uh, Institut de Soudure. How can you be helped by the Welcome Auditor Network? Basically, uh, w what we need today uh, is to, to, to understand uh, if the uh, local communities here are uh, looking to invest uh, in the training of uh, lo local people uh, to, to uh, uh, access, uh, to give them access to, to this good opportunity of ITER, of working on ITER site. Uh, and um, uh, our scope of work, as described, is quite extensive and, and need a lot of skills. Uh, so we need this kind of uh, high-skilled people, uh, and these people need to be trained. So the support uh, of the local communities and the region, maybe, to invest in uh, uh, the, 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 the training of these people is, is important uh, to have them on site with us. Okay, perfect. And the last question, you live now in the south of France region. What would you like to share concerning what you like in Provence for everyone who has been listening? So you know, uh, I, I've been abroad for more than 10 years now, uh, but I'm from south of France and uh, I really love this region. So I'm really uh, happy to be back, uh, back in south of France. So uh, here, uh, especially uh, in, in Provence, uh, we have the, the, the chance to be near uh, the mountains, near the sea. So if you like sports, if you like to be in, in the nature, it's a perfect place to live. And uh, also if you like, uh, bigger places, you know, where you like socializing. Uh, we are nearby large places like Aix-en-Provence or Marseille. Uh, so we hope that the current situation will change soon, but uh, it will be good also to meet many people uh, from many horizons. So it's a, a good place to live, I think. Thank you, Grégoire. Thank you. So Laurent and all the people that, that uh, joined you, um, I personally can say, having moved here uh, from New York about five years ago, that uh, I echo very much the comments they make, both about the pleasure of working for the uh, ITER project itself and being part of something this, uh, this uh, challenging and this, uh, having this chance to make an impact on society, but also having the pleasure of doing that in this luxurious surrounding of Provence uh, with all of its natural beauty as well as uh, the local, the local villages, the local culture. Um, we did not include a Q&A session on the program after this, but we did get one question coming in. And because it's an excellent question, I decided we would uh, go ahead and, and answer it. The question comes in, on the human resources front, are you considering hiring talents not living in France, but willing to relocate? And if so, is there a specific process for that? So yes, absolutely. If you're talking about the, the ITER organization, um, there are many such opportunities. Just go to the ITER website and look at the top for uh, under jobs at www.eter.org. We make a big effort to hire non-French, uh, non-European people, particularly for members that are somewhat underrepresented here. So if you look at the overall distribution of the uh, roughly 1,000 ITER organization staff, uh, we have uh, probably in the region of 60 or 60 percent or a little more that are European, a heavy representation of French. We're lucky to have them. They're highly talented. But some of the other uh, ITER members, uh, China is pretty much on target with its 9 percent contribution, having about 9 or 10 percent staff. But most of the others, the, uh, the India, Korea, Russia, Japan, um, the United States are somewhat underrepresented and so we make every effort to recruit really strong candidates and that process is is very well described on the jobs uh, website at the ITER organization. In addition there are times as you've seen with with uh, developing if your if your company is competing from outside of France for a and and successfully competes for a procurement there are often needs for people from those companies, from those countries, to come and locate here. We have a very, very international uh, look and feel of, of the cultures working side by side here at ITER in, in uh, people you see in the cafeteria, people you see on the work site and so forth, which frankly adds to the, uh, to the benefit of, of working here. This concludes our session for the day. Um, I, tomorrow we will have additional presentations 
Uh, please look at the program, but you will see there are presentations on tokamak assembly, on diagnostics, on electrical equipment, on, on various additional aspects. So uh, please uh, come back, join us again tomorrow. We'll have some more Q&A sessions. And from what we've seen from some of the pre-recordings, some really excellent uh, opportunities, business opportunities that we'll inform you about tomorrow. Thank you all for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed our session. Feel free to uh, send us feedback. Thank you.